If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. So our boy is here today. We oh, we, uh, yeah. we, we did a live, you know, people that are not in our forum, this is something that we're going to be doing you going, missed out. going forward with our forum. Oh, just, get in there now because yeah, we is, are going to be providing way more of these. This is just a way that uh, we're giving back. Um, it doesn't obviously cost uh, you guys any more money or anything like that. Once you're inside of our forum and have access, you'll have access to this. And we've partnered up with some of our doctors that you guys have heard on the show before. And Jordan Shallow happens to be the first one who's just a biomechanic expert probably one of the most brilliant um, oh he's fucking amazing like was he was he a coach over at Stanford right for, yes, the, uh, yeah, for the rugby, for team. rugby right. team but yeah. he was on there live answering questions and we're gonna we're gonna implement that on a monthly basis mm-hmm. um, for our private forum but he was here he didn't have anywhere to go right away afterwards so we're like hey what a great guy let's to have throw him. you in on a qua yeah right. come in on our Q&A and answer some questions so we we picked some questions we thought he would answer best um the guy is smart sometimes hard to understand because he's so damn smart yeah uh, so we did try to translate some of the stuff but if you <laughs> he's a translator uh, <laughs> he's like beast from x-men 100%. He's, exact, he's, 100%. he's the blue monster dude with yeah. the glasses that's, right. that's, that's really, really smart right but anyway so the first half of the episode the first 60 minutes is introductory conversation we talked about his hike with ben pikulski up to like twelve thousand feet or something like that so imagine this you got two behemoths of men <laughs> hiking in waist deep snow yeah. uh, up to 12,000 I want to be, be like amazing. the guy behind the counter at REI when they're like trying to buy all their gear yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> I'm like really? you're going to go you're going to go where? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. are you sure? Uh, I did ask him about what Pakulski gave him pre-hike because I know Pakulski's like a, a mad scientist we, specu- we speculated that he might have some of the four sigmatic cordyceps in I there because I know cordyceps, he's a four sigmatic because cordyceps are incredible helped, for increasing stamina and endurance now the best source of cordyceps that we know of is from Four Sigmatic, one of the companies that sponsors us. If you go to Four Sigmatic, F O U R S I G M A T I C dot com forward slash mind pump and enter the code mind pump, you'll get a massive exclusive discount. Then we talked about telling people what they want to hear and then giving them what they need. You got to kind of trick them sometimes. Mm. We talked about going viral uh, the good way, not the bad way. We talked about the pendulum of the fitness industry and how it swings. And then we talked a little bit about Butcher Box. I can't believe he didn't know about Butcher Box. Right. I Eating know. as much meat as he does. I'm so excited. Right. I know I'm going to get him on it for sure because yep. that guy does put down he's the gonna calories. He's going to eat him out of business. Now, dude, Butcher, he's at 275 right now, and he's, he's trying dude. to push over 300. Before oh, my God. He, so he will He will need Butcher Box. He's Butcher a, Box is going to love him because he's going to be getting the biggest packages. He's straight <laughs> grilling. He's yeah. going to weigh as much as the, the, the beef that's in the food <laughs> that <laughs> right. comes in. The, but Butcher Box uh, is giving away right now, and I don't know how long we're going to have this promotion for, Free bacon forever, no joke, for life. If you such sign a bold up. statement, and I love it. I believe it's just this month they're running that. So after is it just the, this month? I believe it's just this month, and then they're, they're going to end that. Because I think they did this last year, they and they had, actually, to, end it. Yeah, they had to shut it down because it got so crazy. So popular. If you go to butcherbox.com forward slash mind pump, you'll get the free bacon for life, $10 off your first order, and free shipping. Uh, and uh, and then also, what's going on with the, with with Jordan Shallow here at our? So he's facility? got he's got John Meadows with him, right? So him and John Meadows are hosting a seminar here. Oh, it is Friday, July twentieth, from ten to four p.m. at the Mind Pump Studio, so Mind Pump headquarters in San Jose, California. Uh, you guys can find that on his website at the the Muscle dot com forward slash store. Uh, he also, right after that, heads down to L.A. So if you're down in the Southern California area, Saturday and Sunday, July 21st through the 22nd, he's in L.A. at the uh, Ultimate Performance Gym. So and you can, again, find that at the muscledoc.com forward slash store. store. Excellent. Then we got into the questions. The first question was, can cracking or popping your joints, like when you crack your knuckles, cause arthritis or damage to the joints uh, it was awesome to hear yeah who better than to have a, a chiropractor, chiropractor. <laughs> exactly <laughs> give us the 411 exactly. on that the next yeah. question was uh, are there any exercises or tips for strengthening this an- the ankles this person broke their ankle about 8 years ago and now just rolls their ankle all the time what is the problem mm. the next question was are bosu balls and stability balls or things good tools for building Knee stability. A lot really, of myths. Really good conversation. A lot right of here. myths there, yeah. so we had to kind of uncover those myths. Debunked. Finally, what are the most ridiculous pieces of fitness equipment that we've ever seen? Uh, we had some fun with that part of this episode. Also, this month, Maps Anywhere, which is our maps program designed for absolute minimal equipment. All you need are bands 
and maybe like a stick for tension. Basically, you can do these workouts anywhere. That's why it was named Maps Anywhere. Half off the whole program, 50% off. We've never done this before. All month long, Maps Anywhere, half off. We also have Maps Bundles. Now, bundles are where we take multiple Maps programs and put them together for specific goals. Most popular bundle we have is the Super Bundle, which is a year of exercise programming. In other words, enroll in the Super Bundle. You have the next year all planned out for you with your workouts, and it changes from uh, phase to phase, month to month, program to program, your body progressing the entire time. You can find the bundles, and you can find the 50% off maps anywhere on our website, mindpumpmedia.com. But so you you were telling us earlier about climbing and, and doing stuff. Like, I don't want. I'm not going to throw it out there because I don't nah, know if you're nah, telling me. Nah, anybody. it's fine. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Are you? Is that something you do? Are you into like going high altitude Fuck stuff? No, no. Nah, it's just man. It's just a challenge. Like I think we've all. And I don't want to say transcended it as a way that like we figured it all out when it comes to weight training, but I think we figured it out that it's not the only thing. So Ben Pakulski and Alex Viata, we. Um, I don't know how we got it in our heads that we wanted to try and climb Kilimanjaro. So. Alex, that is, sounds like a Ben Pakulski idea right now. Uh, so if you, if you he tried to convince me to do a Spartan race, and I'm like, I don't yeah. know right now, dude. But it comes down to like, it's just, I mean, life is really hard. Like, and you once you finish, and once I was finished with school, I was like, fuck, this sucks. I just want to go back and play in the sandbox. But for me, it was like because we just got off. I mean, I'm fucking burnt red right now. We yeah, were, we were about, embarrassed. Yeah, <laughs> we were about like I think we were just shy of thirteen thousand feet yesterday. So we climbed Cloud Ripper in the um, in Bishop, California. How's so, your stamina when you do something like that? Uh, it's so it's funny because you have so much muscle. It's two seventy five right now. Uh, yeah, so I would assume that because you have some more muscle, you have you, you require more 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 blood, more oxygen, and if you haven't trained that way anyway, it's got to be kind of exhausting. Yeah, so I mean, I've been doing a, a like a strict regimen of cardio the past couple months while actually gaining weight because I'm going up. Are you wearing your uh gas mask while you do that? Yeah, man. Yeah, elevation training mask, bro. <laughs> get at me. I just like I doing Bane it. impressions. I'm really good at it, man. Yeah. Like that's, yeah. Yeah, get, um but yeah, so we we did a climb. I just like it because it's it's just a challenge and it's funny because you get to see how people their personalities come through in their challenge, right? Like that's kind of basically mm-hmm. what character is. Mm-hmm. And very, the like, three of us are all very different. Like Ben comes from bodybuilding, I'm powerlifting, and Alex Viata is like, he's a kind of a mix of everything. Like super jack, super shredded, um, super strong, but also does like double Ironmans. Like he's fucking crazy. And you see how each person's personality comes out on the hill because <laughs> like Alex led the way. He was our tracker, very technical. He had his he had his like hiking poles. I'm like, oh fuck, man! I showed up in literally a beater. Like you can see, <laughs> my tan line goes all the way up to my shoulders because I'm like, all right, well, I'm gonna fucking get the guns Dude, out. Could you one. imagine seeing this guy in Pakulski up in the fucking high altitude? <laughs> there was two, like fucking Sasquatch. <laughs> but I couldn't even move. <laughs> we came them. across two people, and they're both like, I think they kind of laughed because like, oh, they're never gonna fucking make it. <laughs> but it was funny. So Alex, very and his personality is very technical. He's very intelligent, like extremely extremely intelligent and he led the way and he was like you could see every step was calculated and that's how we that's how he goes through life and you put him in the challenge and that's an expression of kind of how he operates ben is you know he's very uh he's very conscious driven he's very um mindful uh, mindful yeah that's probably the best way to describe him very disciplined and you could very supportive and you could like so it was ben in the back alex in the front like fearless leader gun it ben is just like come on hoorah guys like we got this <laughs> And, and I, you kind of get to look at yourself and go like, all right, how do I respond to this? And it's just like head down, don't say a fucking word, and just go. <laughs> Which like, is totally your personality. Uh, yeah, too. And that was it. Was funny because it's like I, this I, out. I feel like that's very preliminary in development, right? Like trying to just work hard instead of smart. Here, have Alex leading the way. He's probably at, at that particular endeavor is the best at it. Like he he made it to the top, and he was like guiding us through. Dude, I was waist deep in snow. At thirteen thousand feet, wearing fucking like Under Armour shorts and hiking shoes. Oh shit! Yeah, like it Damn, was. It was for fucking... reals. Ab- abdominal snowman. Yeah, sure. That's <laughs> that's abominable? probably the best way. Ab- I said abdominal. Yeah. Abdominal. Yeah. abdominal. <laughs> you got them abdominals. Freudian, oh, Freudian snap. slip. Yeah, my bad. Um, Show me your abs. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so it was just to me. It was just like the brute force is a very preliminary way to get through things, mm-hmm. and it's like seeing their other two approaches <laughs> is like definitely looking to adopt more. Mm. 
more of that sophistication like Alex has or more of that mindfulness like Now, that knowing has. that you went with a guy like Pekulski, uh, did he give you anything to increase like oxygen, you know, uptake or... or so the, I, like cordyceps, for example, is something that I like to use for, for stamina. I'm, ass, I'm assuming he gave you something like that because I, I know Ben probably woke you up in the morning with a shake of stuff. Uh, what he had, so he actually did this keto. He's in the middle of this thirty day. Oh my god, keto that's thing. keto to do this. To yeah, do oh. so it was extra wow. crunchy granola. Like it was. Well, it wasn't because I don't know if that's a carb or not. But it was. He had this like. Oh, what was it? It was fucking. It got me. It kept me going. It was like a. It's a type of carb that's big in the keto world. You guys might know it. I don't. It starts with a Y. It's like a, it's like a super starch. Yohimba or something? Like, no, no, no. no. Is, y- yucca, yucca something. <laughs> okay. What is that? I, I don't no know. Idea. So it's, what I could derive, it's like a very complex oligosaccharide that okay. won't spike your insulin. Okay. Essentially. So that was like kind of a, like a Ben thing that I was like, all right, man, what just, when he hands you stuff, you just take it. You just <laughs> yeah. go slam it down. I, I, I don't want to know why it's wrong if I don't take it. So <laughs> I'm just going to take it. Um, but no, other than that, um, I actually read before that beets. Beats yeah. are supposed to be good, yeah, so yeah. I had some of those, and that was by my own, <clears throat> um, kind of by my own research. Yeah, um, for stamina, I would go like beets, uh, cordyceps, of course, carbohydrates, and he if he had the carbs beforehand and he was keto leading into it, that would have made him very sensitive to the carbs, so he probably got some good stamina out of it. Yeah, he- um, I mean, considering you guys are so big and you did that, like, mm-hmm. you know, that's pretty fucking- Do you get sore- after shit like that, because it's so many reps and so different from what you're used to doing? Yeah, it's totally. I mean, again, did some work, but I think the thing, like you mentioned in the beginning, is you can't train for that kind of elevation. You no. can't train for that kind of, um, the, that decrease of partial pressure of oxygen. And again, having a bit more muscle mass and and requiring more of that to have oxygen while you're utilizing the muscle. It was like, you, my hands would swell up, and but just being at elevation. And the nice part was, is like, I mean, I'm 275. I've been as high as 285. So being out of breath isn't a new thing for me. <laughs> so it's almost like the Incredible Hulk thing where they go like, oh man, what's your secret? It's like, oh, I'm always angry. So, you know, we'd stop at like 12,000 feet and Alex, like, how you doing? I mean, winded, obviously. Like some of the some of the gain was really acute. Like the, the grade was really like, it wasn't rock climbing, but you were scrambling a little bit. How long did it take you guys? Oh, uh, all told, let's see, we started, um, we started at like 8 a.m. and we got off around 4, 4 p.m. Oh, shit. Yeah. Did you just bring snacks? Yeah. Yeah, dude. <laughs> well, that's the thing, man. Like, you, like I brought, I brought three meals like of beef and rice and I couldn't even touch them. Yeah. Fuck no, dude. At the, sh- the sharpest rock seemed like the best idea. I was like, oh, well, if I die, I die. <laughs> it was, um, yeah, it was crazy, man. But like the appetite, like being at that altitude, like really messes with you. Not yeah. like none of us. Cause that was kind of the, the, the reason for this trip was like, let's see how we respond. Cause you can be the best athlete in the world, put you at altitude and you can get altitude sickness. There's totally. not really yeah. a, um, the I, only way to train for it is to train in it. That's yeah. Really the only and way I think it's, I think a lot of it's vestibular. Like I think a lot of the, because I look at it almost like seasickness or motion sickness mm-hmm. where it's like there's something with that partial pressure of oxygen that plays with like the vestibular cochlear apparatus and you're kind of in the your, your inner ear. Um, but luckily we made it to about 12, 5, 13,000 and we were fine. Uh, you know, Kilimanjaro is just under 20. So it's about 19, 19, 5. How are you going to prepare for that? Just more, just more. Just more what you were yeah. doing. Like, so the hard part with yesterday was the climb was, the climb was difficult, but the descent is... The climb is hard on your on your CV, like your cardiovascular. The descent is hard on your, um, like on your joints, on your mm-hmm. body. Mm-hmm. So fuck, man. We, so, we made it to like this this like we kind of lost the trail out of the start. We're like fuck, did anyone see a different trailhead? Like we started like trending off course a little bit, and then we intersected with this with the trail we should have been on, and then it kind of went into one up to the green mm-hmm. or Brown Lake, and then we went up around Green Lake, and then up into Cloud Ripper, and then there was an old lady there with her dog. So it immediately kind of gave us like she was mid sixties. And it kind of immediately gave us some perspective. Like me and yeah. Ben are like, not being a pussy. <laughs> yeah. And then she's like, oh, morning, gentlemen. And she's like, oh, you guys took the hard way up. I'm like, oh, fuck uh, yeah. All right, <laughs> wicked. We're going to take old lady route on the way down. Fuck, it's sweet. <laughs> so we, we keep going. And then she passed us and we end up at the lake. She's playing with her dog. It's like, oh, fuck, man. All right. Everyone got a sack up here, fellas. Let's, <laughs> yeah. let's, let's go. And then so we get, we get to the top. And it's just crazy silent. Like I've never heard a lack of noise like that. Like it was, mm-hmm. and especially in California, like things that are that aesthetically pleasing, there's, there's a lot of people, but it's hard to get to. 
so those same lot of people are usually pretty lazy. So mm-hmm. it's like it's different than going to Santa Cruz boardwalk and be like, oh, it's nice if you took a, the 20,000 people out. Mm-hmm. Um, Did you have the energy to take some shots? Did you take any? Photos? Yeah, we took a couple. You know what? I think there was a collective thought of like, we're doing this for us. We're not doing this for social Good media. Good for you. Good yeah, for you. and it was it was cool like to be around people who like agree with we that. Just and we just and it was an unspoken thing. We we're mm-hmm. like, hey guys, we're gonna keep this off social media. Like, <laughs> we just kind of like enjoyed the time like normal people. Mm-hmm. Or I don't even know if that's considered normal anymore. Right. Um, but anyways, on the way down, we're like, oh fuck yeah, we're at the we're at the impasse. We're gonna take old lady way down dead tired i've eaten shit a few times ben took a great like a couple tumbles um the last two miles the old lady walked two miles on a drainage pipe what it was a fucking 18 inch drainage pipe for two miles for two miles on the way down literally so so here we're thinking like oh fuck yeah we got this geriatric trail on the way down (laughs) this fucking old lady (laughs) walked two miles up on a drainage pipe with her dog and that was the easy way so i was on the way back down and it's like so are you going down the drainage pipe yeah (laughs) because we're thinking like all right this is going to be like a couple feet and then like we go around the corner then it's like just smooth trail all the way down it was a fucking drainage pipe all and we're talking like Damn. 30 foot drop on oh, the, on the right side like you're looking at 70% grade jagged rocks 30 foot drop to the bottom if you slipped off this drainage pipe Dude, like it was a level of like mindfulness that like yeah. it's dire consequences. It's kind of cool, it's kinda cool that happened to oh, you. Oh yeah, but it's right. like I probably would have fell 10 times more or I mean I didn't fall at all. I probably would have fell like 10 times over if I was just on a regular trail because I was just throwing my legs in front of me up to mm-hmm. that point. But it's like, all right, you got to find another gear here and you mm-hmm. need to be very present for the I next. I was just going to mm-hmm. say, nothing mm-hmm. makes you present like that. Oh, nothing. yeah. I, I, did a hi- I did a hike in, in Kauai and there were definitely whole periods of uh, uh, or parts of this trail where if you, you, yeah, you have to be entirely crazy. focused on what you're doing. You can't think of anything else. And it's at that moment, you don't really have a t- time to be afraid because you're just kind of focused. Yeah. Afterwards... You start to process it all, and it's that. What's that? What do they call it? Type two fun. Yeah. Where after you're done, you're like, "Oh shit, that was awesome!" But yeah. while you're doing it, it's like you don't want to be a part of the Nepali coast forever. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's a real trail. Yeah, man. yeah. That's yeah. Are you ta- you're talking about the Kalalau? Yeah, trail? yeah, yeah. This, yeah, it's we did. Really. We just got back from Kauai. Oh. I got back from Kauai and got in a car and then went to Bishop. Oh shit! So, oh wow! Yeah, yeah. It's it's been traveling like yeah. crazy lately, man. But, but yeah, yeah, that high altitude training. You know, it's the adaptations to altitude happen pretty quickly. So if you train at altitude for like a week. Your body adapts pretty quickly, but the adaptation goes very fast in the opposite direction. So fighters learned this the hard way where they would go train at altitude. Then they'd come back a week before the fight and they'd fight and they wouldn't get that much of a carryover. Well, it's literally last, explain, last, like, why, explain why you wouldn't train with an elevation mask because I know there's got to be people listening. Elevation masks, the adaptation you get from elevation mask is you may strengthen your diaphragm or your ability to breathe in, maybe, but it doesn't reduce the... It doesn't improve your uh, your blood oxygen rate. You're not carrying your, your your red blood cells. You're not increasing the number of them when you do it. So it's not at all like training at altitude. Yeah, it's increasing. It's like sucking in harder is what yeah, you're doing. It's, 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 your breathing. Yeah, it's d- decreasing the total amount of air you can breathe in. But air is an oxygen, right? right? Nin- 60% of air is nitrogen. Right, right? Right, so right. the oxygen is such a small component. So you're, it's relative versus absolute vol- or, uh, ratios that mm-hmm. you're dealing with. So, I mean, the original stimulus that, that they thought um, – was increasing urethropoietin, right? Yeah, EPO. Yeah, but it's like, <laughs> there are better ways to do that if that is your end goal, right? Mm-hmm. So I think, um, yeah, it, it's just another fucking, it was just another gimmick that came out. I just think the aesthetics of it made it really appealing. I think, it's like, the, I don't know, that's so funny to me that that, that would make it appealing, like wearing a mask on your face well, when you're working. It, does, it does make your workout harder. <laughs> There's a market for making your workout harder. You can sure. invent something that right. does nothing beneficial but make your workout harder. Yeah, that's a good point. And people will buy it because they're like, it's oh, harder. fuck, yeah. dude, that workout kicked my ass because, you know, while yeah. I was working out, you know, I got this fucking new <laughs> I just, machine why that you just put me? duct tape over your mouth and go work out? If you okay, so you, have you guys yeah. heard about and this is new to me and this is you know weekend with Ben Pakulski open your eyes to bullshit <laughs> <laughs> taping your mouth shut when you breathe wait while wait. you breathe no, no sorry when you sleep oh yeah I've oh, seen that yes. okay You're sorry paleo effects I was fucking blown away actually I was with Ben when he got introduced to that right so we were at paleo effects and they help with sleep apnea yes they brought it over and it's like this clear plastic that goes over your lips yeah and it gives you like this little hole to kind of barely breathe through dude oh, that freaked me out I feel like man. I feel like I guys know, buy right? that shit for their girlfriends like no honey it helps you trust me just <laughs> put it over your mouth I can't talk then yeah yeah, yeah but you want good sleep right yeah put it just, on your mouth 
himself by a ball gag like a normal person. <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with you? No, but I did notice the adaptation really quickly. Like mm. what we Bishop was about, or we stayed in Mammoth Lake, which is about like 8,000 feet mm. of elevation. And dude, the first night I was trying to sleep, it was like breathing through a straw. Yep. Like it was, it was, but you woke up the next day and you're like, oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is, this feels all right. Oh, and interesting. Then, then you go up. To well, you know, that carryover, I, I mean, I know, you know, more red blood cells isn't going to make you necessarily stronger, but when you're lifting, if you're, especially if you're a big guy, those little, those little adaptations can de definitely contribute to, you know, better lifting, better working out. Sure, man. I mean, I would have loved to have been able to track like hematocrit in a transient period of time to yeah. see what the adaptation is. Cause it's just, I mean, if you guys ever heard of Bjorn Reese, Mr. 60. No. So Bjorn was like a, he was a cyclist before like Lance got popped with doping. Okay. So the reason they called him Mr. 60 was his hematocrit levels when they tested him were religiously around 60%, which is like the viscous like the viscosity equivalent of like having maple syrup in your veins. Oh, because he was on the dope. So like he was, he was on injecting the EPO. himself. Yeah. With EPO, like crazy. Yeah. Running syrup everywhere. Yeah. Right? It's crazy. Yeah. But it's like, you just wonder how much, like how far you can push wow. that, but then also like relative and get a heart attack. Yeah. And that's the risk, like the risk benefit ratio for something like that. But I definitely noticed whatever. And I'm assuming that's what the adaptation was, was more, or even maybe an increased carrying capacity of the red, red blood cells mm -hmm. I already had. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But man, it was night and day from literally, and uh, pun intended, from when I went to bed to when I woke up, that eight hours of just being at that elevation, totally different person. In the yep, yep, yep. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. Any habits that you picked up from Ben since you hung out with him? Anything anything he turn you on uh, to? You know, it's more the process. that, And with him and Alex, it's more the process of like how they think and the levels in which they think is mm -hmm. pretty neat. Because I think if you, if you can gain skills that allow you to think deeper within a vein that you already kind of know, then you can actually use those skills of depth of thought and apply them laterally to different concepts right. rather than most people trying to be, I and mean, we've talked about this in the past where most people are trying to be a mile wide, mm -hmm. but they're an inch deep. Mm -hmm. I think if you can go a mile deep on something, you can start to transfer. Like that's Renaissance. Like that's Da Vinci. That's, you know, mm -hmm. he's, he's an artist, he's a poet, he's an inventor, but it's cause he can, if you, and I, I'm reluctant to use the word, master something because that's a mastery has become like the bay of 2018 yeah. like it's just a fucking overused yeah. buzzword yeah. um but if you can really try and d dig deep and that's where these guys go mm -hmm. and like i get i get accused of being like overly complicated with things like unnecessarily binary really? in details that's i weird. know <laughs> really <laughs> you know what man part of it is when people look at me they think i'm stupid so i'm like uh, all right i'm gonna throw a 17 syllable word at you and then once we've got that then i'll start so this is a, this is a mm. critique i have for you that i really believe that it, it, i can totally relate to this that we have this you know first someone meets you they see you're a big buff guy right away they're gonna think you're a dumb guy yeah but you don't i think you 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 cover that within the first five minutes of it meeting me i mean once you once you meet you for five minutes and you talk like you're not dumb they're for sure you're not dumb like you're good so i think if you just start like that and then you kind of shift to like this you dumb it down a little bit after yeah. that then i think you can earn that you can still keep that same respect level i, I just think with the the internet it's like i'm always having a first impression right mm -hmm. every time someone comes across a youtube fair, video dude. it's like i i need them to know that this isn't a youtube fitness channel right like mm -hmm. that's not the goal of this this mm -hmm. is this is a little bit and because i the thing with me and this is a little bit of an aside is i don't if you have the skill set to tune a ferrari you can do an oil chain on, on a Corolla, right? Yeah. That's within your depth of your, your scope of practice. Right. Where it's like someone who can only do an oil chain on a Corolla can't tune a Ferrari. Mm -hmm. They can't mm -hmm. scale up. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's like if I can like if I can take someone from a you know six hundred pound bench to a seven hundred pound bench, you want to bench one thirty five? All right, kid, give me four weeks. That's right. That's, That's kind right. of thing. Where right. it's like having that ability to scale down is always easier mm -hmm. than to scale mm -hmm. up. But there is a certain level of I'm reluctant because I don't really believe in the word emotional intelligence, but there's and the ability to read a room when people are starting to glass over with the anatomy stuff. Like, okay, the hip bone attaches to the knee bone. Got it? All right, let's yeah. move forward, mm -hmm. shall right. we? So, yeah, it's... I well, the, the thing I appreciate a lot about guys like Pakulski and, you know, people like Greenfield, even Ben Greenfield, is uh, it's not so much about... And I love hanging out with guys like that because they're not talking about what to think as much as it's just how to think. There's yeah. a difference there. And I think... People of the of that caliber, it's it's the way that they think that allows them to dig deep into different subjects and to be open minded about different things. And the the thing about any field, I don't care what field you're in, the longer you're in it, 
the, the there's like a, a curve where you feel like you know everything and then you stay in it longer and you start to realize you don't know shit yeah. and then you start to stay in it longer and then you start to realize like whoa there's a lot more some of that weird stuff or whatever like I'm going to start digging into that because I feel like I covered all this other stuff and it just gets deeper and deeper and deeper the deeper you go I think it's there's just no how, bottom. it's how you source your information too like they they exist very much in the realm of like the esoteric where the majority of people who <clears throat> pursue uh, more information are looking for like the checklist seven habits of highly successful right, people right, right, it's right. like are you fucked and this is like I have a big sticking point and we always end up on the on the topic of podcast culture just like the books that are coming out like the four hour this and this and it's like mm -hmm. that's and the, I think that's a di that's a distillation of very intelligent people mm -hmm. but it's like I want to read the books that these people read right like I don't want to fucking read you know how to become a billionaire in three easy steps because that's not applicable I want to know the intangibles and where you like who you read that inspired you to come up with this no, I don't want to just read these three steps and it's like well yeah no yeah so, but you as a thought leader though has to know you need to know that you're the minority with that thought process sure. you got to know that as a as a as a as a thought provoking business leader now that that and that's something that we are challenged with all the time it's one of the hardest things about this business right now is ha keeping that integrity and and because i think we all believe the same way too i remember when we were first doing like our lead magnets and sales funnels it's like fuck, dude how do we get these people's attention because we have something really good for them that we can provide and we know we can help them and change their lives but we know damn well that they we've got 15 seconds in this little feed it's like that's one of the hardest things to do. Well, yeah, because, I mean, you don't want to be the fucking Mike Chang six-pack abs thing. Oh, but yeah. if that gets your attention, it's the old bait and switch, right? If get them in the back of the van, then we're fucking good, right? That's <laughs> yeah. kind of the goal. <laughs> but it's just uh, the hard part tag is and tag I think, <laughs> 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 but I think the big problem is whether it's, it's opportunistic or people, like, I would be one thing, I'd almost have more respect for people that are putting out these books, mm -hmm. that if their goal is, all right, easy sell. People don't, people don't like to learn. Right. Every time, fuck, every time I hear someone re reference like stoicism and there's some Marcus Aurelius Instagram mm -hmm. quote, it's like, okay, let's take a step back. Mm -hmm. You can read Marcus Aurelius and put this out, but that's the idea of like thoughts and actions. Like I would rather read someone like Primo Levi. Mm -hmm. Like you want to talk like a, a someone who embodies the tenets of stoicism in real time, mm -hmm. you know, courage, justice, temperance. Um, he can can work these things into his own life and then purvey that. I would learn, and I would suggest that majority of people would learn from reading an experience like that than reading like actual, like just Marcus Aurelius or reading these, you know, these checklists for your life success and all this stuff. So mm -hmm. I just think there's such a there's such an echo chamber of of personal self help and Instagram entrepreneurial shift where it's like all right guys let's take us let's peel this layer back but, let's go a layer but deep. you know what we, mm -hmm. one thing that was I mean a huge paradigm shift for me years ago I started to realize that because I would see this ridiculous shit in our industry but then you look at all industries and you see a lot of ridiculous shit and you get angry and you think why are you guys selling people this stuff or why are you saying what you're saying. And it, you, you would get angry, but then you realize it's that's what the people want. Like, here's a quote. I'll read you a quote from Thomas Sowell, who's one of my favorite economists of all times. And this applies to our industry, but he's using it because he is an economist and he talks about politics a lot. And he says, the fact that so many successful politicians are such shameless liars is not only a reflection on them, it's also a reflection on us. When the people want the impossible, only liars can satisfy. So when we look at our industry, like fitness, and we look at all this bullshit that people are putting out, why is it all? Why are they putting it out? Because this is what people want. Yeah. I want to lose thirty pounds in fucking one week. They don't I do want. Work. I don't want to do any. I want to take a pill or just tell me one thing to do that's going to change my life forever. That I'll never. That's going to be super easy. And so that's what they keep getting. They keep getting a bunch of bullshit. And it's like it doesn't sell to say the other thing I, I, unless you can really make, unless you can really appeal to the psychology of the individual or start to. Get them to understand the why, and that's a tough. That's well, a then long you also game. Have, you also have to look at the the emotional side of it too. That if it, if something triggers you, where it fires you up or pisses you off, and it changes your emotional state, you have to ask yourself, what is that inside of me that causes that? Because it's normally rooted in some some sort of insecurity. You touched on it a little bit ago that you know you you've got this this chip that you got to come off really really smart, and that's bro. I'm telling you right now, everybody in this room knows how brilliant you are, but really what that is is your own insecurity oh, of, of feeling that way, yeah. you know? And the more that you get comfortable with that and understanding that and then learning how to, okay, 
yeah, that's how I feel, and that's that's what justifies me doing this. But is that the the best approach? And it, do you have the ability to rethink that and and put something out different? That's really challenging to do. It takes a lot of uh, experience, maturity, uh, open mindedness to be able to look at yourself and go like, you know, this this passionate feeling I feel about this. Even even touching on the you know stoics, uh, stoics like it's you know there's good stuff in there, and I, I think that. If you have the ability to to read it, digest it, and then apply it in in real world, I think that there's some value to that. I don't think it's I don't think it's something that you knock. I just think that and that that feeling that you have to want to knock that. I think again, that's rooted in your own insecurity of looking at another really brilliant mind or intelligent people that are putting out information. So I'm always about like okay, whenever I feel like this, feel really passionate about it, you know, stepping back and going like, oh fuck, okay. Is this am I am I getting trapped and stuck in my own my own insecurities my own beliefs and that and it's limited me from growing beyond where this current level that I'm at right now. It's the, tough. The problem I have in with the quote that you mentioned is the market that we're in and all markets do this it, because they're, every time you're selling something you're selling a solution mm-hmm. but but first they sell you the problem. Right. That's that's the issue. That's the issue that I take up with. Like when I see these fuckers come up, we've cracked the code. It's like, and I think you <laughs> might know who I'm talking about. It's like, really, really, you and your 14 inch quads cracked the fucking code. Get the fuck out of here. But it's like you're creating a problem and you're instilling a, it's fear mongering. And this yeah. is whether you're selling some bullshit fucking body program on Facebook right. or whether it's your Wolf Blitzer in front of a 20 foot sure. fucking hologram on sure. CNN. Right. It's 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 predatory. And that's yeah. what I don't like yeah. because it's, it's fear no, of the unknown. And if you get educated, you liberate yourself. Right. You do. And I do believe that you you have a responsibility to present things in, with integrity and, you know, with accuracy and with honesty. But I also believe that the the there's a massive responsibility on the side of the consumer because the reality is the power is in the numbers of the consumers. We're the ones that sure. drive it. We're the ones that drive the market. Because look, tomorrow, if everybody today... Stop following all these stupid pages. They'd all disappear, and the market would change, and they would try to deliver what people are asking for. One of the re- one of the things I love most about the age of information that we live in is, I'll tell you what, you've been in fitness. How long have you been? It's so different how, today than it was bro, fifteen years bro, ago. Bro, it's so different. People, yeah. as, as much bullshit as there is out there today, people are a lot smarter than they were twenty years ago. Twenty years ago, I used to have to like sit down and like convince women. That if they did a fucking weight training exercise, they wouldn't look like, you know, Dorian Yates the next day. I had to sit there and convince them. Today, way less of that conversation. Yeah. I mean, just something, and it sounds it's so basic. Our, our business is an example of this. Yeah. Uh, to the average person who's on the outside looking in, and you look at our, you know, quote unquote, social presence right now, we look like we're still a small business. Mm. But when we meet and we talk to some of these people that we're we're picking on right now that sell a lot of this bullshit, they've got millions of followers. Our business is doing two, three times the revenue oh, they're sure. doing because we're taking care of our people. And that shit gets out nowadays. And we're in a different time. See, 15 years ago, you couldn't Google search Yelp real quick and find out all these reviews and stuff. So you may be able to pull, you, you may be able to gimmick people and, and pull some shit off for one, one or two dumb people. But even those dumb people, they go through it, they find out it doesn't work for them, or it's bullshit, they get hurt, whatever the make case would be. They go right away, they get out there and they Dude. put that shit out there. And that travels and that eventually poisons a Dude, business. Three years ago, you know, we, we did an episode when we first started on uh, the myth of the small meal myth. And, and what, I, what I mean by that is like the extreme, like I got to eat eight times a day to, burn more fat and build more muscle. And we did a whole episode on why that was a myth. And it's completely, I mean, this is 100% like today, three years later, it's totally accepted, not a problem. Three years ago, we did that episode. Do you know how much pushback we got from people? Yeah. Telling us it was we were full of shit and that's, everybody knows that that's super effective and it's the best thing to do for your body. And we're like, actually, no, there's zero science supporting eating six to eight times a day. Have you guys looked at your statistics outside as far as conversion rates outside the United States? Because this is something that I've started to notice is that the fitness industry and the market in the United States is much different than in any other countries. I can go to Australia for a month and like I, I can sell out seminars across the country in and I can charge a decently high price for it. In the States, I could do one for free and like no one would show up. Mm-hmm. I just, America, this is the most competitive market 
for fitness by far. And it's just competitive. You also appeal to that market just like we appeal to that market because you say fuck a lot. Yeah. Is that what it is? Yeah, you yeah, yeah. you know what if we yeah, said the word cunt? cunt. Yes, yes, that's yes. a big one. They yeah. love that. Yeah, yeah. no, they, they love us out there because we, we I think we are like that, yeah, you know? Yeah. I think every other market other than the States can draw a difference between notoriety and credibility. And I think that's the biggest thing. And that's what you touch on with the followers. It's like, yeah, yeah you can have social capital all you want. But if you can't transfer like transfer that to revenue, then you're not worth you're not worth shit, right? Right. So I think in the United States, like if I had, you know, half a million followers, if I had five hundred thousand followers, I would be able to sell these seminars out mm -hmm. where it's they look at the 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 initials, the work experience, the, the 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 information that I put out in other countries before they look and oh how many followers because that's um, how how was it described? It's it's consumer trust. It's a it's a it's a personal stock market. Mm. It, that's what following is, right? So what are you trading at is essentially the equivalent of how many followers you have. Mm. That's consumer trust in the market in the United States. That's how that's how I look at it. Mm. So that's the hard part is how do you build a, a high converting following, right? Like right. how do you have that thousand real followers impact people? But how do you blow that out? Because some people like how do you blow that out to a million followers, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because you're trying to well, sell the them. The question is, do you even need to? But it just, I mean, more is always better. Well, that's not true. See, I disagree with that. I think that, I mean, I remember telling the boys when we first started and we were, you know, we kept talking about how we were going to see this hockey stick and one day we're just going to go viral and blow up. And I was scared to death of that because we didn't have the systems in place at that time. Sure. And sure, we could, if all of a sudden the mind pump went to, you know, a million listens per episode, you know, and, and just quadrupled real quick like that overnight. Well, yeah, the business dollar wise would quadruple where we're at right now. But then I would look at it like, oh shit, well, we don't have the things in place to capture, to retarget, to keep to grow to keep growing that. That could have been a hundred million dollars that only ended up being ten million dollars. But do you think people that make that acute hockey stick spike are worried about that in retrospect? I don't think they're worried about it, but they should be. But would you rather have to deal with it ex post facto than not deal with it at all? So I would, I'd rather, I would rather deal it with it because here's the thing: if if once you do in this business, if someone comes across you on the the internet or podcast, or whatever, you really only have that one or two times to capture them, and then you're fucked. Sure. So if you come in and my website isn't dialed in, I can't answer your question. My customer service is terrible that way. Your program isn't legit. Like if all these things are shitty, they come in one time, and that's their experience. Even if you evolve the business I later on the, and you get better, they may never come back. I again think the point you're making is there's nothing wrong with the hockey stick of growth if it's if you're prepared and ready for it. And most many times people aren't, and you end up getting. Here's the other thing too: is like well, because they become so focused on dude, the, you, the spiking part. Here's the chicken in the egg. Yeah, the, exa the algorithm. Can I hack the algorithm for Instagram or YouTube or all these ways to gain followers? And, when it's like, imagine if you could snap your fingers and make everybody fit and ripped all of a sudden. Would they be in the same position as if they took time to learn their bodies, grow, work with their bodies, learn nutritional? They wouldn't be in the same position. They might look fit and ripped, but there's not. Now, with business, you see a lot of businesses crumble under their own weight because they'll, for whatever reason, something about them goes viral and they fucking disappear because they didn't learn anything uh, because they didn't have the time to, to do so. But I mean, like speaking in the space of podcasting and influence and having like a, like, uh, what was it? Ferris put up something about some kind of mackerel fish he eats or whatever the hell. And fucking Whole Foods sold out across the country. Mm -hmm. Here's Whole Foods, oh, wow. whose supply chain is probably on part. Like I mean, once Bezos take over, you know the supply chain is on lock, yeah. right? And they fucking sold out. Do you think the mackerel company's going, ah, fuck, we're done. Oh, it's like, yeah. no, right? Or like, um, you guys have Vincent on the show, Matt, yeah. yeah, right? So when Rogan had that kick today in the dick cup, yeah. just sitting there, like yeah. how many fucking units probably flew off the shelf? He guaranteed you yeah. back order Oh, you can shit. definitely make the argument that it's a good problem. Yeah. You, you could definitely make that argument. But well, I'll it's a better you, problem than never growing. Yeah. Sure. Right? But, but I'll, tell you, that. I'll tell you what, if, if had, let's say we exploded within the first six months and then we get called by Rogan or someone big and they're like, come on our show. I don't think I don't think we would have done well. I don't yeah. think we would have been ready. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And then that would have that could have potentially killed us. I think us. most these most of these kids that you see explode on social media aren't ready. Yeah. They're not ready for a real business, not one that's going to last 20, 30, 40 years. Sure they're ready to collect revenue. Sure they're ready to to buy clothes from China, put their logo on it and sell it for two times the price yeah. and make a couple million dollars really quick well, off people. You can see by the decisions they have to make after that too. Like they're always trying to recreate that viral sort of yeah. like product that the, it just doesn't exist like it got you there but you didn't have any systems or any kind of business behind it to actually like capture those leads i just think yeah that that viral is always niche and then your mm -hmm. typecast it's like 100 mm -hmm. percent, dude yep. we know people and look i know people in social media it's i'm not gonna name to i'm not gonna name names but 
who got really popular doing crazy, wild, you know, insane shit. And guess what? That's all they can do now. Yeah. They can't do anything else. How do you convert that? And how does that last for 15 years, 20 years? Well, you got to start with a broader base. Like one, um, this is going to sound really weird, but Ed Sheeran, his illegal downloads for his the one album surpassed Michael Jackson's Thriller for all time most illegally downloaded album of all time. Wow, I didn't know that. But if you think that. think of his think of his skill set as a musician, he's never came out in a single genre, mm. right? So his base is so broad right. that well, I'll listen to Ed Sheeran, I don't give a shit, right? And I enjoy his music, but his music is so different. It appeals to so many people. It took a while for him to build his base, but his base is so broad now. Mm. And that's the same thing with fitness is like if you're bench pressing chicks or like doing backflips <laughs> and deadlifts and stuff, it's like Guess what? When you try to branch out into our space and deal in more um, maybe thought provoking topics in, in fitness and more depth and detail, we're already here. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. We can branch from the central part because I, I think it's funny because oh, I forget what I was listening. It was one of these lacrosse ball foam roller type people who sell you nonsense right like they sell you accessories rather than giving the 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 education and the tools to assess your own body and just implement accessory movements into your training right Mm -hmm. where it's like they use the phrase and it really stuck with me it's like we're we're creating products that liberate people it's like you know how you liberate people whether it's fitness fuck yeah Yeah. Yeah. fucking right and that's what drove me nuts because i i'm not going to name names because it just came to me who it was but it's like every time there's some trumped up lacrosse ball and you're or a theragun yeah. and you're you want to fucking you want to deal with scar tissue put a three-quarter inch jigsaw blade that's the only way you're going to change the fucking actual structure of that muscle <laughs> every time you got a wine cork at the end of your fucking dremel you're not doing shit but they can sell it because they sell you a fucking problem and they give you the solution yeah. right and it's bullshit and they'll tell you that they're liberating it's like no you're fucking not you're keeping them under the the hammer and sickle you're not teaching them anything. That's such a hardwired formula to sell a product, which is something that, I, again, ba- like bringing it back to the consumer, that that's a that's an overhill battle for us as, as trying to be educators to overcome. Well, sure, because you're selling them on the problem. Is, you know what your problem is? You're fucking stupid. Yeah. That's the problem. <laughs> and I got a solution hey, for tell you. Hey, you keep telling your you, listeners man. that they're never going to buy shit. <laughs> well, we, don't, we, don't, we don't say it like that. I'd rather convert, <laughs> I'd rather convert a higher percent of a lower amount of people. Yeah. 100%. And, and no, I think the people you convert totally are the people agree. who are going to be smarter enough to realize that they don't know it all. Just re- re- realize this. If you have a problem, it means you don't know enough. Because if you did, you wouldn't have that problem. Sure. That's really the bottom line. I don't yeah. care what your issue is. I don't care if it's fitness, health, your life, your marriage, your, 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 your work. If you're in a situation where you're like, this sucks, this is a problem, realize you just don't have the right information to, to solve that problem. Or you have the information, but you don't have enough information to learn how to implement it or the the, the, the wherewithal or even just the, 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 the guts to do it. All but, of which is just a level of ignorance. But then you're telling people that they have to take responsibility for themselves. Yep. And get right. good, luck, good luck selling that yeah, in this world. Yeah. Well, actually it's, a, actually, it's funny you say that. There is this change in the, in the culture that I'm starting to see. I mean, I really follow, uh, I really follow things like politics and, and, and you look at some of the things that are now popular on YouTube and, and videos and articles people are reading. There is this shift in the culture right now where that's starting to become cool. It's starting to be cool, become cool to tell people to become more responsible uh, for themselves, to change, you know, if you, be the change you want in the world. That's something that's starting to be, to resonate with people. And I think it's because we've been sold the other bill of goods for, for so long that it, and that leads to like, you know, shit, like what, what do I do? Life is feel, feels like there's no purpose. And so I feel like that old message, that old wisdom Starting to come back a little bit. It feels that way, at least. Yeah, yeah, but so we're high top sneakers. It's ebbs and flows, man. You know, it's like it's it, what are we going to say? Never went out of style. Well, <laughs> <laughs> talking to dad socks over here. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, it's, and this is the thing when you start to look at the cyclical reiterations of ideas over time. Is like, are we just who is going to be the 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 poster boy for the like what gandhi said that before like, you know be the change you want to see in the world all right is peterson the new gandhi is the, is that the 50 year iteration of this from mm-hmm. 1947 to liberation of india and the commonwealth of the you know, uk I, to to yeah. peterson fucking what 60 years later I think it was seven, michael jackson's man in the mirror oh is that what it yeah, was yeah, yeah, how yeah. Was, how was, that was the, the change <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. um but yeah so it's for me it's just like 
then you start to see patterns of this and then okay is it just going to fall the wayside again only to research that's interesting yeah. it's interesting that you say like ebb and flow because i've always looked at it like a like a pendulum thing right so i guess you're right i mean that's it's it swings one way yeah. we go super extreme and then it's like oh fuck this is killing people this is not a good a idea this is really bad. yeah right and then psh, we come back the other way then we'll probably go to that extreme and then come back again and i think in the arena in the fitness arena there's no there's no more concentrated market of that pendulum effect to yin and yang like that in such a short period of time because it's like it's just hyper extremes like we talked about earlier like you know you guys are at paleo effects like where would have that been 20 years ago yeah. right mm -hmm. you never would have saw but now it's too too far raining in raining in raining in holy fuck what's mm -hmm. going on please put shoes on why are you burning that shit what's going on what are you eating don't yeah, eat that like yeah. that's the way i look at it now where at some point at some point it'll centrate, but then at some point it'll veer right again, yeah. and then it'll just constantly. It's be. definitely, it's definitely swinging hard that way right now. It's crazy that we. I remember we went to Paleo what two or three years ago mm -hmm. the first time, and I remember walking in there and it's being like, it's so opposite of a bodybuilding convention, but, but also the same, but yeah. so same, it's so much the same, very right? very similar. You know what I'm saying? It's like you you traded out the pre workouts and the stringers for you know blue blockers and jesus sandals like it's literally in uh, bone broth yeah, yeah it's 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 the same thing but different it's really it's really unfortunate because i i now and i believe there's there's a little bit of good in all of it you know what i'm saying yeah. there's something to take from all these different camps i just don't understand but i think i want to believe that people like all of us and the message that we all kind of share is I want to think that that's going to become more popular and people are going to get wiser. I just, I, I, they are. I think it was easier to fool people 10, 15 Dude, years ago. Any time anytime throughout human history when, when information has become more accessible to more people, we've made incredible advancements. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean along the way bad shit happened yeah. and there was a lot of pushback. But for sure, I mean, the internet is... It's like the printing press, but sure. times a trillion. Yeah. You know? I mean, when the printing press was invented, you got to understand, the only people that had access to information were nobles and the church. Yeah, and monks. the way you got your information was through the what they said to you, because they were the holders of this information. They were the gatekeepers. And so through their voice- Right. Imagine how long it took like cities to get on board with shit that was like stupid or bad ideas dude, like back in the day. So it would take like a year for it to travel from like one side of the country the, to the other side The original of the bestseller, bestselling book of all time was after the, the printing press was uh, Marco Polo's books on, on his travels. And, and that must have blown people's fucking minds to read this book about these weird- people living across the world and animals and what the hell's going on and maybe things are a little different and it, you know it's largely believed to usher in the renaissance now we have the internet where holy shit man I, I could access any i can access all of the recorded information of that we've ever had throughout all of human history for almost free but that's insane the problem that we're having is that there is that curation I was, yeah. you your information is being curated mm -hmm. well this is right. what we talk about so i believe in the future you're gonna that's what you're gonna need to be able to do and we talk about this on the show all the time that you know you need ratings and reviews you will need to you will need to look for the opposing argument in everything that gets sent to you if yeah. you don't you got to be very careful because if you and that's it's a know, marketplace for information just yeah, like anything because you like you like this you like that then all of a sudden you're being fed all the things you already like yeah. and all the things you already agree with which we know how dangerous that can be. Well, not even just being fed it. Your your ability to find a counterpoint, if that counterpoint, because it's all privatized, right? Like the biggest publishing house, you know, it's not Gutenberg, it's Zuckerberg, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's it. So it, when oh, you know, he, he's okay, we're not going to go down. <laughs> okay, we're nice going to raise that in, yeah. Um, <laughs> but like you know, I'm not trying to. When that you're gonna, <laughs> just the last name. Why? But when, when you're like, <laughs> you know, when you back. see. <laughs> <laughs> you see like when you see things like YouTube, you know, taking down videos of, you know, and I, and I have patients at work and they tell me about the landscape of the, 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 the political culture within the company. And it's like, yeah. they're very proud of it, but that some of that pride might be based in uh, ignorant conscientiousness yeah, and bias, right? Yeah. But uh, bias isn't, I don't think is a bad thing. Are, are, are they're not able to discern bias and novelty, which is something that I think a lot of people have a hard time differentiating with. It's like, you're just hardwired if you see something different to just have a latent, because it's like, oh, that's new, right? But I think if these are the, to, if they're going to lengths to override the human experience online and not mm -hmm. be able to 
give you or withhold the information of some sort of counterpoint. I really think that that's a scary the process. I think forward. that's always been a problem, but I think it's less of a problem, far less of a problem today than ever because there are so many channels and in, in ways to deliver information and things can go viral and they're almost impossible to control. It's very difficult now to control information. If something pops out, like information, look at, look at, here's a, here's a good example. Okay. A company like Uber or Airbnb would never, ever, ever, ever be allowed to exist had they not uh, existed because of technology faster than people could try to put a lid on them. They would never be allowed to exist. There's no way in hell the taxi cab fucking cartels or the hotel cartels would ever allow those businesses to flourish. The problem was they flourished. They, it's again, because of technology, they exploded faster than anybody could fucking free, figure out what to do about. Now they're trying to put you know limits on them. Good luck. And that's how all, look at when 3D printers go fucking live, like just wait till 3D printers are cheap and very, very, uh, and, and very advanced. Try to control guns when you can print your own at home. Good luck. It's not going to happen. Not going to happen. And this is with everything. So is it a good or bad thing? Well, here's a, this is the way I look at it. If, if mankind is destined to succeed, it will speed up that process. If we're destined to fail and implode, it will also speed up that process. It's up to us. I'm, I'm a firm believer in let us do what we're going to do. Let us be free. Let the information come out. So far, it's been a fucking great thing. I just think, I mean, we're all speaking from a place of when we look to get educated on topic, we'll go down the necessary rabbit holes to find the education. Mm -hmm. I think the majority of people, their news is just curtailed for them mm -hmm. and presented yeah. in their, yeah. sure. you know, things you might like on YouTube. So it's very much, it, it puts all them on their own eyes. echo chamber. Exactly. Yeah. So I think the 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 issue is you know it comes down to the individual it comes down to the consumer whether yeah. that's a consumer of fitness products or a consumer of information it's mm -hmm. doing the due diligence but like you said with fitness it's like give me that pill give me that thing that's going to fix me in 30 days and it's with it's that same mindset which is the base of the market yeah. whether your market is a news channel based off sensationalism or whether you're selling a fucking jaws or size it's, or whatever the fuck it's, it's the same thing it's right? speeding that's it's, in the question i know it's actually, actually it's speeding oh, up we have questions yeah, oh, yeah. We, we'll, we'll get to that we'll get in a second. Yeah. it's speeding up the process i'll give you two more examples okay you look at the the uh, gay marriage this is a great example in 2008 was so unpopular that if you campaigned for gay marriage, no way you would have won office. In fact, yeah. Obama and Hillary Clinton both campaigned and in their campaign said, no, I believe marriage is between a man and a woman. Four years later, four years later, you would not get elected had you said that. That's within four years. Sure. Look at marijuana legalization. The fastest public swing we've ever seen in, in, a, in a topic like that to the point now where we have the president of the United States, who's a Republican, literally saying, I will back federal decriminalization of marijuana. Movements like this used to take decades, like the women's suffrage movement, decades, civil rights movement, decades. Now it's like five or 10 years, and this is and it's gonna technology. Speed, it's going to speed up. Yeah. Very fast. That's why I think these, so when I, when I see these people doing things like we see in our space as far as all the gimmicks, like it used to get me mad. It doesn't make me mad anymore because I, it puts a grin on my face. I'm like, that means that's lots of opportunity for people like us yeah. because it may, it may be a, a little bit slower process for us right now. But we're in this for a long, in the long haul, you know. And those people might make it quick to a million dollars and make that quick buck. But it, eventually, what happens is the people that go through all that they find out it's a gimmick, yeah. and that just like you, they have, they just takes them. They have to fuck up first. You're smart enough because you've done the research. You're willing to do the homework. You know what you do when you educate wanna... yourself. They're 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 not smart enough to do that, so they buy into it. They buy into it. Well, they find out it's here's bullshit, a good example. And they look that. look what Amazon did. Like in the past, ten years ago, if I wanted to buy a supplement. I would go by the reputable looking brand or by the athlete that was, you know, on the cover of the magazine that was selling it. Today, I don't give a shit about any of that for the most part. I'll go to Amazon and I'll look at the fucking ratings. Oh, 175 ratings, five star. This is a good one. I think I'm going to buy this one and take it. Will you though? Will you? You're more conscientious than that to put it in your body based off the public opinion. Oh, I'm, I'm talking about the average person. 100%. Because that's that. curtailed. That's that's just as if YouTube is taking down counterpoint videos. Amazon is rising this public court of opinion and presenting this to you. That's people not doing their homework, right? I think there's some, there's, but that's the thing. There's way more information in that rating. There's more information in the rating that I can look at my Uber driver on my app than there was in some agency that said that this person is safe. Or sure. if I go to a restaurant and, oh, it's got an A rating no. versus I go on Yelp and I see, but it's got three stars because they said that there was a 
cockroach in their food, or whatever. Yeah. Like it's 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 definitely the problem with markets always has been an information problem. How fast can information travel? That's always been the issue because by the time information gets around, people have gotten screwed. Well, isn't information it like how, just isn't it like now. how people knocked Wikipedia when it first came out? Right. Yeah. I think it comes down to publication bias, though. If I have a nice meal and I've had some nice meals, I'm not going to go. I don't think Thomas Keller needs a pat on the back. If I'm going to yeah. go to French Laundry, I'm not going to give him five stars. Sure. It's the fucking guy who like didn't like the the waiter right. because he was mm-hmm. Italian yeah. and you know <laughs> disgruntled. He, yeah, he got pissed off with yeah. the pineapple and his pizza, <laughs> and all of a sudden. But it's a, and that's what I think is Terrible. a big issue is the publication bias, yeah. right? Like because yeah. and but you know if I'm in a small if I'm in Bishop, California, and I need mm-hmm. a place which was the case yesterday. Sure, Yelp, fine, fuck yeah. whatever. If, you know, if I need to find pancakes somewhere, I'll go down that route. But if something's going in or on me, you better believe I'm not. I'm not leaving that that verdict subject to the public court of opinion because yeah, yeah. people, especially disgruntled people, there is yeah. no more entitlement yeah. in this country than someone who's pissed off and has spent it's money. True. Oh, yeah. it's so true. it's like every so there's uh, that, and they incentivize other business owners. They have to rate and review in order to then receive rate and review. Yeah, so well, don't like, even get. I mean, yeah. being a small business owner in the Silicon Valley and yeah. dealing with Yelp on a next to yeah. daily basis. Oh, like, you know what the next level of that's yeah, going to be, right? Tough. The no. next level of that is going to be you're going to go to a business and rather than looking at random strangers who who rated that business. You're going to connect through Facebook or whatever and see all the people that you know that have gone there and what their ratings are. I'd be okay. I have and that'll f- be way more. That would be even another level of accuracy. I would appreciate. Like, I have a friend of mine. He's my movie critic. If he likes a movie, I don't go fucking see it because he's got shitty taste in movies. <laughs> so I know that. I could at least interpret that. Because you know him. I have a friend exactly. Like, yeah, no, there's, like, some, oh, there's a lot of value in that. Yeah. If I knew exactly all the, all the people that are connected to me, what they like or didn't like, exactly. Like, yeah, that, exactly. Would be, that would be more trustworthy be like, oh, than just Adam, random yeah. 500 people. Adam likes no. this hotel. It's probably yeah. super fucking expensive. I'm going to go But super plush and comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. Questions. Let's do it, Doug. This quaz brought to you by Organifi. For those days you fall short on getting your organic veggies or whole food nutrition, Organifi fills the gap with laboratory tested certified organic superfoods to help give your health and performance the added edge. Try Organifi totally risk free for 60 days by going to Organifi.com. That's O R G A N I F I.com. And use the coupon code MINDPUMP for 20% off at checkout. What I was going to ask Jordan was uh, Ben and his pin, in his uh, ketogenic diet and how that's been going, and if he if he knew that if he was eat, using Butcher Box or not, and if you're familiar with Butcher Box yet. Uh, both questions can keep it real short. I have no idea, and I have no idea. Oh yeah, yeah. okay. So Butcher Box is cool. It's uh, gra- grass fed and grass finished beef that gets shipped to your house, and it's a, they cut out the middleman. Super so quality. So you get a whole, wholesale prices for like AAA quality type meat. Super dope. It's like a subscription model, and they eliminate the middlemen, and the it's super super. Quality. You would actually really like it. Yeah, I was gonna say off air. I'm probably gonna pick your brain about that. Yeah, no, you, I'm, yeah, I'm putting it back lately. Well, like, you know what we'll do? Brain. What we'll do is we'll give you the code. Uh, what is what is the code? Doug? Mind pump. Is it just mind pump? Yeah. Butcherbox.com. Do they forward slash mind pump? Mm-hmm. All right. Why don't you use that, Jordan, so you can get our discount? All right. <laughs> what a friend I gotta eat yeah. right so yeah. no no you'll like it I mean bro we'll make so much commission off of him this guy he's yeah, probably right. I, I want to cut of that that's bullshit yeah we don't make commission uh, off of no. it so it doesn't really matter we should though with but him. you save you yeah. save a bunch of money on it and you get bacon for life bro right oh now. yeah uh, you yeah. get life that's bacon what, bro well the nice thing with that is in. your life might be pretty fucking yeah. short if you get a lifetime supply like he's got three months tops bro they just started that promotion I'm like oh my god that's like the best deal ever right fucking bacon for life I'm sold just on that alone Exactly. Right. So, bring on the questions, Douglas. I don't have a microphone. Oh, he doesn't get a mic because we're going with uh, with four. And he oh, didn't okay. have to read him. So. Yeah. All right. First question is from Tom J eighteen. Can cracking or popping joints, such as cracking knuckles oh, or neck, ugh. cause arthritis or damage to the joints? Before you we, get into this, we sh- we got to start with the, well, well, the professional the cracker. We got to start you with know, him. Well, here's the deal. Thanks, I, bro. I, I feel like <laughs> that's what my diploma says. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I want whack him and crack him. I feel like we should say something before he does because he's uh, obviously yeah. this is his his realm of expertise. Now, my understanding when you when a joint makes a sound where it pops, it's like pulling a suction cup off of a a mirror, right, or a window where there's. Uh, pressure that's being creates, uh, created, you pull it off, that fluid uh, goes into the, the, the space that you created, the air comes out or the gas comes out and it creates a pop. So that's what that, that's all that's kind of happening. 
from my understanding, when when a chiropractor does this to your spine or your neck, and I think it might have been you, uh, Dr. Shaw, that told us this, which I thought was absolutely brilliant. Yeah. When you're adjusting someone, it's allowing you to move and articulate small areas or small parts of joints that weren't moving. They were kind of frozen. And that release, so the ability to move and with all the muscles I used to connected. think it was just air in the joints. I used to think it was air in your- It's a gas. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's it's what I gas. thought. Yeah. Let's hear it, dude. Okay. Yeah. Right. Did you did you see the back of your head with the way you rolled your eyes? Uh, no, no. It, it, it's because it's you called him Doctor Shallow. It's, it's, no, I was very no. Um, Doctor Shallow is my sister. I don't know. If this is me working right now. Uh, my, my bad. <laughs> uh, no, no, you're good. I just think it's such a common misconception. It depends on the joint too. Like, it, you, first off, the arthritis thing is no. Um, from the research I've read, based off longitudinal studies, like go to an old folks' home, ask them how many people have arthritis, show your hands. How many people crack their knuckles their whole life, show your hands. You're not going to see that correlation as direct as your mother would tell you when you're five years old, crack your knuckles saying you're going to get arthritis when you're older. Um, now, the physiological effect, the popping, especially in the spine, which is kind of the realm that chiropractors deal in, although we do adjust extremities, which I think is a little bit more, that's more, extremity adjusting is actually more physical alignment as it pertains to the adjacent position of two bones and the function that they're going to have as they work kind of symbiotically together to go through like broader ranges of motion. Then the actual spinal adjusting, where I think spinal adjusting is way more, the popping is almost a, uh, it, it ha it's it's kind of contemporaneously like it, it occurs in, s in simultaneous with the the actual effective mechanism of correction where it's not the pop doesn't necessarily mean good or bad it's it just happens sometimes with yeah them. I think okay. it's more so activating a stretch reflex and understanding kind of the the neuromusculature of your the spine itself mm -hmm. like when you know the multifidus would probably be the most widely use even though that's kind of fairly rare like if i said rotatories or intertransversarii or some of these deeper layer deeper layer seventh layer back muscles that are innervated by part of your spinal cord that you can't consciously control if i said flex your multifidus you can't do it right you can put yourself in a position you can put yourself in a position where that reflex loop of that dorsal uh spinal nerve can activate that muscle um the problem is when the, the adjusting the cracking of the back and neck is when you crack your own back and you rotate it you're using large muscles to create an end range and then you're creating an imbalance where you're actually biasing a, a relative motion, a counter motion between two of those adjacent vertebrae. When it's passive, and I do it, it's it's completely inert, and that that stretch reflex is activated without being. So you're trying to activate a a stretch reflex, and, and now by the way, when you are doing these adjustments, is there research that shows? Because I, I think I read something that shows that there's a localized pain relief that happens from. It's almost like your body's relieving or releasing pain relievers at the site of the adjustment almost like when you foam roll and you feel immediate relief sure from what are they called noce receptors that get activated no, yeah noce receptors but i think to the proprioceptors and stretch reflexes right like it's basically whatever the intervention is you're you more or less from a functional standpoint you're trying to have uh, an effect on the nervous system right always mm -hmm. but think of the locus of 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 motor control right it's it's you know prefrontal cortex creates this motor pattern it gets put out through the spinal cord through ventral spinal nerves so if i said flex your bicep or flex your quad that's ventral spinal nerves through the front of the spinal cord uh then there's a reflex sensory input loop through and then you kind of have this like a posterior column that's going to calibrate for um like proprioception and position in space and then so it's feedback to the brain it's feedback to the brain so but if it goes brain to oh, yeah, brain yeah. to <laughs> if it goes brain to muscle muscle pulls tendon tendon moves bone ligament stabilizes position sure. of bone why would i then start with bone when i can go right to muscle Right. So when I address when I address extremity issues, I can, you know, you have hip issues. I'm going to go right to the muscle mm. first because that's the it's one deviation closer to the to the nervous system than the bone. Right. Mm -hmm. There's no osseous. You're taking neural, out the middleman. Yeah. There's no osseous neural junction. It's myo neural. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So if I can get access to that nervous system and the perception of that mm -hmm. nervous system from the muscle, then I'm going to try and do that. So the, the way I think about it, too, is like uh, and I'm going to use a very simple muscle people can understand because I, 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 I mostly understand what you're saying, but it's very complicated. And some people listening right now, right now, might be like, "What? Okay, They're so I'm like, gonna shit. Use, should I pop my knuckles or not? I don't yeah, so, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna use a very simple, simple base like the bicep. Like sometimes people would come in and hire me, and I'd work out with them, and they'd have a sore. The front of the shoulder would be sore, and 
And, and I'm, I'm just going to sit, you know, I'd have to do an assessment and all that, but then I would establish like, oh, you have some inflammation at the bicep joint or excuse me, the bicep tendon, which goes over the front of the shoulder, perhaps. Yeah. yeah. Stretch out the bicep and many times immediately they would have a little bit of relief. Now, the way I would, the way I, I think about it is the bicep might've been tight due to poor function for maybe it was overused, whatever. It's in that constant kind of constant state of tonus that might be happening from the central nervous system. That stretch gets the CNS to relax a little bit, and that's why they feel a little bit of pain relief. When you go deep into these deep, deep muscles that are, like you said, layers and layers deep, muscles that we can't really consciously control, getting them to stretch and move, like good luck doing that, especially if you're locked up because you have poor recruitment patterns. Then you go see someone like you who... Besides all the other things you do, because uh, just adjusting someone, I think, is a small piece of really what you do, but the adjustment gets those muscles to move a little bit and stretch a little bit, which tells the central nervous system, chill the fuck out for a second, and they get the pain relief. Am I doing it justice? Am I explaining it in a way that- Yeah, yeah. Okay. Basically, these muscles that we're trying to affect, are they're, they're there to protect your spinal cord. Right, because they just run from bony prominence on like they run from bone to bone in your back, from vertebra to vertebra. Very in your small. Back. So if you know one vertebra moves through a plane of motion relative to its other too far, whether it's flexion, extension, or lateral flexion or rotation, like the majority of people that come into my office, it's never a good story. Like when I get like the the very stereotypical like I threw out my back thing or I slipped a disc, and it's like all right, sure, but we don't have time for that. But it's it's what's happened is they've moved in a position usually in all three planes of motion at once. It's I was leaning over to pick something up, I twisted to the side, and then I rotated. It's like okay, now you there's a muscle that's getting stretched at each time you move that, and what it's what it's accounting for is if this but one bone one moves too far into bone two in the middle of bone one and two is a spinal cord that we really would like to go through life without impacting because what we like walking oh, and yeah. controlling bowel and bladder function oh, I see. so these muscles are like the second they've perceived that stretch fuck they don't move anymore right. yeah so it's like you need to you know just and like that's wow that's interesting so is that when you when someone comes in complaining of slip disc or whatever yeah. Is that more common that it's it's more related to that than it actually well, is? Well, so correct me if I'm wrong, Jordan, but many times, you know, slip disc or bulging disc, many times they're asymptomatic. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Fuck. Best. So I hope if someone's listening to this and they know someone that has a disc issue, because people wear disc issues like a fucking, sc like a scar. They carry it with like them. Like a badge of honor. Sometimes. Yeah. And it's like, oh, sorry, I can't slip disc. It's like, dude, what? Like, we're just walking upstairs. Yeah. Like, what are you talking I about? I wonder how many people would have a slip disc if you just MRI'd everybody. You'd probably find- 25%. Yeah. And, and out of that 25%, how many of them would actually feel pain and Oh, symptoms? it'd be 25% that are asymptomatic. But here's the mm. thing. So if- So no symptoms. So if we think of it- Thank you. Yeah. If we think of it, think of it this way. Okay, so so very common place to herniate. I'm discs. like the subtitles. <laughs> so, a very common place to herniate discs is in your lower back, right? Mm -hmm. So most axial force, we don't have any ribs. You know, if your core is weak, you're not going to have any functional stability. Yeah. Air quoting functional. Um, so often you'll see either at the at the apex of a curve, so L3. Or you add the convergence of a curve, L5, S1. Mm -hmm. So where like, you know, the sacrum curve bends one way, the lumbar spine curves another, the thoracic spine, and right, so right. on and so forth. So what will happen? So imagine a nerve leaving a, sp a spinal segment through a vertebra to innervate a motor, for, like function, right? So mm -hmm. superior gluteal nerve innervates the glute medius, right? Which is a lateral stabilizer of the hip. What do you mean by it leaves it? It leaves it prioritizes that. No, no. no. So out, out of that particular spinal level, and I want to say it's L four, L five, L four, L five. I'm going to have to brush up on this, and someone call me out if I'm wrong. I think you're right. So if that fun <laughs> if that nerve leaves and goes to that muscle, so if we're talking mm -hmm. purely about the glute med, which is the it's, lateral stabilizer of the hip. It's the nerve that controls that muscle. Yeah, yeah. That's what. That's a good way to put it. Um, what happens if we think that glute med is a muscle of stability, it has to stabilize the hip. It's not a muscle of strength. So every time you get a hip circle or a booty band or do something like that, you're not training the function of that muscle correctly. Anatomically, based off origin insertion, resisted abduction and external rotation will in turn, based off your anatomy textbook, that'll be the action of the glute. So we're getting it stronger. Cool. But so say the, the output of that nerve is 100%. Right in an, in a non pathological, your disc is exactly where it should be in a perfect world. In a perfect world, but you're you're training either so you're not training your glute meat at all, or you're training it with this resistance where it needs to be stable. 
the actual function, because you're training it to be strong and not stable, at best is say 50%. Like so give I, an example of that. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So if you're using a hip circle to do like monster walks with, and you know, you don't have low back pain, you're really only training that muscle, the glute med to let's hypothetically 50% of what it's capable of. But that's because of the, that's because of the it, adaptations are very specific. So to use another example, if I train my bicep to hold the weight stable for a long period of time in this isometric contraction, most of the adaptation is going to be isometric. If I train it to, curl and extend i'm going to get some isometric strength but not max out i'm not going to maximize its adaptation kind of well i guess the point i'm trying to get at and this is a bit of an aside is there's a difference between strength and stability as it comes to stimulus adaptation okay right? like you speak italian i do okay so if i well, put not you, really but kind okay of. if i put you in like barcelona could mm -hmm. you order lunch and get on a train maybe so sure latin-based languages have there's a carryover, carryover. there's yeah. a crossover so a lot of the research on like and i'm going to use the glute mead specifically because it is so inundated into fitness culture and buying accessories right, right. i'm glad bands. you're going this direction yeah. yeah so glute strengthening is a huge market because they uh, think that's the ticket to like low back pain and all wear this stuff. for everything yeah exactly which i think is dumb because the glute mead works more around a helical axis around a y-axis where gravity goes gravity comes straight down so the bicep is a great example because that works directly in opposition to sure, gravity sure, it has sure. a, it has a it has a necessity to be strong mm. so if we think about it if sal didn't work out so not working out and then it, having back pain so the heaviest thing that you have to lift is your own body weight. Mm -hmm. And then you just want to get back to a baseline of normal. That's the equivalent of Sal going to Barcelona, ordering lunch, getting on a train. He's not fluent. He's not, he's not physically literate in the, in the analogy, but he can get by. Mm -hmm. But now imagine Sal is Sal, right? Sal's like, he's pulling 500 pounds, beltless, no strap in the garage. He's trying to get jacked as fuck. Beater. He's yeah. exactly that's that's the anabolic factor. <laughs> yeah. He's now he, that's the equivalent and the analogy of him moving to Barcelona and having to live there. You need to speak the right language if you're if you're pursuing being mm -hmm. sh like uh, if you're pursuing um, like progression in a in a gym setting or progressive overload. If you're extra physiologically loading your own body, you need to make sure now that that split between the stimulus adaptation starts to matter. So a lot of the therapeutic interventions, even if it's a well-trained college age male, it's like, all right, well-trained my ass, right? <laughs> well-trained compared to anyone in this room, they're not trained at all, yeah. right? So going back to the disc example, so if we're not training the function of that glute properly, and now we have a ceiling of 100%, we're only training at 50, then you know you slip a disc, like actually herniate or have a bulging disc or a sequel of that of that uh, of, of that fluid outside of the annulus fibrosis, then let's say the function now or the ability for that muscle to to transmit force right goes from 100 to 70. Relatively speaking, because you've only trained 50% of the actual function of that, because there's some carryover if you know Italian and you're going to Spain, sure. there's some carryover to building resistance against stability. But now you've dropped 30% here, your 50% function goes from 50 to 20. Somewhere in that range is your threshold for pain. I would rather take 100% of 70 mm. than 50% of 100. But it's just people cross that threshold, they see a black and white on MRI and they go, there it is. Mm -hmm. that, that's the issue. It's like, no, no, no. It's the dysfunction. We can fix the function and we don't have to worry about the structure. That's right. Right? So that's how I look at it for something like a bulging disc where it's like, figure out where the function is going wrong. And that's the most common one I see because mm. people don't understand because you don't have to, you can't sell. No, and they, they, people think of it like a broken bone. It's not a broken no. bone. It's not like having a broken femur where you got to let the femur heal. Like, again, you could literally MRI, you could image a hundred people. You're going to find a good chunk of them are going to have herniated or slipped discs and a good chunk of those people aren't going to have any symptoms whatsoever. Sure. And then you get people with pain for no apparent reason whatsoever. It always goes back to dysfunction. Let's it's an sure. acute injury. Yeah. You know, chronic pain is typically just dysfunction. But the problem is we don't have standardized gold. Um, the majority of people don't have the, the facilities in which to standardize right. assessment for function. Right. People have tried, but it's so hard because you it's can't too individual, mm, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. But you need to understand the core tenets of biomechanics to really be able to apply it across the board or just with training. Right. Like you need to understand the, the different loading parameters that people are going to mm -hmm. be capable of. Right. And like understanding that the scale for someone in this room. And that's why my practice has become so niche to athletics is understanding that here are the core tenets. But here's how we scale out the stimulus to have an effect on the nervous system of someone that can squat 900 pounds. Right. So it's being able to walk that fine line. Like 
the majority of people, like if you had a, if you had a 600 pound client and you were even the most inept personal trainer in the world, you could get that guy to lose a hundred pounds. Right. Just based off of like, you could food pyramid the guy. Right. Like you go back to 1995 food pyramid him yeah. and you'd still be able to get him to lose a hundred yeah, pounds. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I take but someone, take someone that from 6% to 5% body yeah, fat. That takes <laughs> someone harder. in this room to do it. Yeah. yeah right. So harder. that's, that's the thing. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. All right. So the next question is from uh, Brady Charisse. Any exercises or tips for strengthening ankles? I broke mine about eight years ago, so I'm super prone to rolling it. Like to go on long hikes and runs a few times a week, but inside of ankle and Achilles feels very inflamed when done. You know, it's funny when people say I broke something and so now I'm super prone to hurting it. I I think what people f- think that they or what they feel is because it's broken, it's it's the, the tendency to hurt it again because it's been damaged is much higher. The reality is because it broke, first off, something caused you to break it. It may have been a bad recruitment pattern, maybe not, but after you broke it, you definitely weren't using it uh, in its most optimal way because it was in a cast or whatever. And then you were healing, you were probably walking funny. So now you've created just bad patterning, which makes you more prone to injury. And, yeah, but and, you, you don't really think that a broken ankle is coming from a, a bad pattern, do you? I mean, sure. that's it. That's it, it could be, or it could be, it could be something else. I so mean, you think? You, so you're you're thinking along the lines like I I break my ankle playing a sport, and because mm-hmm. I have a bad recruitment pattern, I, my foot didn't strike the ground the way it should have struck. Or I wasn't the stable it's somewhere. Trauma that just came, or in even the force. ability to react to yeah. Yeah, stimulus, right? Like, I mean, I have a friend of mine, Corey Schlesinger, is a strength coach for the men's basketball team at Stanford, and you should see some of the stuff he's doing with like. And I'm not a flow guy, right? Like I'm not a primal movement tumble. Get the fuck off the ground. But he thinks. <laughs> but think of it. Like I think of things I like see it the the rate limit. What's your bottleneck, right? Like so, I look at strength like an equation, right? Like if my squat is a is a is a value that's a, uh, that's uh, expressed of the strength of my quads, the strength of my hamstrings, the stability of my core, the strength of my upper back. What a lot of people do will just the work inside that equation, right? Like, okay, I'm going to isolate my quads to get them stronger. And then that should appreciate the strength of my squat. Mm -hmm. But I look, the way I program for people is what's going to be the the multiplier on the outside of that equation with what little I know about math is you solve for the brackets first and then you times out from outside the bracket. So we can solve inside all we want, but if this multiplier outside the bracket isn't one, Mm -hmm. again, it's just like the distance. I would rather take a hundred percent of a cumulative 85% of relative muscle strength within that movement pattern, then try and focus on, I'm in a front squat, I'm in an RDL, I'm in my hamstrings big, I'm in my quads big, and then have a blown ass eye joint that puts my multiplier to 0.5. Right, right, right. right? So what, what Corey does link. is, yeah, which is really interesting in sports, like you almost said, like, you know, kind of shit happens, right? Shit happens in sports. Well, he'll, he'll have his basketball players do calf raises on his other players' feet barefoot. So like hmm. getting that reactive stability to, well, it's not so much what happens Very when you roll stimulus, this ankle yeah. is how much can you stabilize on the other hip hmm. on the, on the drop of a hat. So right. like, dude, we just climbed. You don't think I've rolled my fucking ankles walking yeah. up that goddamn hill like right. 10 million times, but I trained so much unilateral hip stability. And we had this kind of on the Q and a mm-hmm. earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, on the Facebook live where it's like, I think so much of that, that re that rehabilitation mm-hmm. after a break. Cause once you damage the structure, it's the same thing. Like I've, I got hit by a Chevy Suburban like five years ago. I got T bone in the middle of an intersection. I had to Mel Gibson lethal weapon to my shoulder back into place in the middle of the street. Ugh. Yeah. But I mean, you guys know rotator cuffs enough to know that we can regain function. Uh, we can regain structural integrity through improving the function. Mm-hmm. The ankle's totally different. Contract your anterior talofibular ligament. Mm. You can't do it. If he broke his ankle, likely that one went. So rather than worrying locally as the, the integrity of the foot, worry about how we're setting the trajectory for the ground forces for that foot to absorb force totally. in the first place. Totally, because yeah. uh, what Western medicine tends sometimes tends to do is they'll look, oh, your knee hurts. We're just going to look at your knee. Yeah, and it's like, isolate. yeah, well, it could be from your hip. It could be from your, your ankle. With an ankle issue, I would look to the hip and I would look at the foot. Those are the the most mobile places that are, you know, more proximal to the ankle but are not the ankle itself. So if your hip, if you have a weakness in your hip, if your hip can't stabilize laterally, doesn't rotate well, whatever, and you go to make a turn or cut or whatever, and that hip isn't strong enough or stable enough to support you, it goes right to the next joint. And if your ankle's not strong enough, now it goes to the joint itself. And then it goes to the ligaments. And if those ligaments aren't strong enough, you tore something or you hurt something. I mean, I got blown away just by 
learning. Dr. Brink blew us away with uh, how, how dysfunctional feet are on people nowadays. It's yeah. absolutely insane and how much of a, uh, an impact that has on like my squat. I, when I started working on my feet, I started feeling more stable in my ankles. And it sounds obvious now, but it wasn't so obvious then. I thought it was all about you know just my ankles. So themselves. something that I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll walk on my tippy toes. I do tippy toe squats. I'll also get on the edges of of fins of yeah, of edges of my feet and i'll squat like this i mean is there any value to the, doing all those things do you sure think? i mean it's just like i like training fringe ranges of motion like like i talked about earlier with training purposeful thoracic flexion in the spine it's a series we've done on the mind pump youtube channel where it's like and a lot of people are like whoa that looks really scary but it's dude it's so controlled you know what's scary life life is right. raised. Yeah. sports fucking sports the are unknown. real scary yeah, yeah right. exactly so i think it's and i mean we could we could boil this out to, I mean, we could take this down like a, like a philosophy route as well. Right. Like that is essentially stoicism. Like it's a stoic means of training your own body. That's like put yourself in a position either mentally mm. where things are really bad right. mm. and then everything relatively seems okay. It's the same thing with building resiliency and strength in your body. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, train those end ranges of motion, be prepared for the unknown. Like Justin said, where, um, just a, I mean, a quick one for me would be the, like when I'm, when a joint loses its structural integrity, it'll look to gain that and cast it like neurologically. Hey, we know something's not right. right. So with something like that, I would just look to address some of the muscles that just like with adjusting, right? The idea of like, okay, I'm trying to bring together a stretch reflex because it's, it's, it's perceived a relative uh, motion well past its physiological, um, limitations capacity. yeah capacity is a good way to put it now all of a sudden you know whether it's a multifidus seizing up to keep l4 and l5 close together or whether it's the peroneals that are seizing up to keep the relative position of the fibula onto the base of the first and the fifth metatarsal because that relative position has changed unless you again you don't have to you know you could adjust the ankle if it's indicated but you could address the actual muscles themselves because they're so superficial getting that neurological down regulation to say hey there's no more threat we're not in that position anymore we don't have to stay chronically short because that rigidity leads them to being unstable it does and it, and it, and it causes inflammation it, when a muscle is in this kind of you know low level state of, of being you know activated because your body thinks that there's an issue there or is afraid to move that causes inflammation. Tense or flex any muscle all day at 25%. Just do that. Clench your hand a little bit, hold it all day long, and see if you don't start to notice inflammation at your fingers and at your wrists. So with something like this, I would say definitely work on strengthening the ankle itself for sure. Move it through ranges of motion, activate, uh, you know, create tension in those ranges of motion, but also work on your hips. Work on your ability to rotate your hips, work on your ability to abduct and adduct and you know, extend because I feel like it's when I've seen people roll ankles, it's usually coming from a lack of lateral stability in the hips. I'm, I can get like that. Like I, I tend to, I like to train. So, mm. you know, straightforward sometimes that I, when I'll go finally remind myself like, Oh, I should do some lateral stuff. I can feel like my, if I push this too hard, it's not my hip that's going to get hurt. It's my ankle. Yeah. That's the weakest link. What do you think about things like then like kin stretch and doing like a combat stretch that's activated where so you get yourself in this, you, you drive the knee all the way over the More toe. isometric kind of like and tension that you're applying yeah, in like range of motion. Yeah, well, it depends on if the bottleneck or the rate limiter is strength or stability. If you're going to apply that PNF type principle where you're contracting in an end range of motion, that contraction is not going to be evoking a greater stimulus of instability. It's going to be adding some level of resistance or isometrics. It, it, I think it could be potentially damaging. And the reason I think this is because we have to go back to stability being appeased by structure and function. When you're in that end range of motion, it's like, yeah, there is going to be a, a stretch applied to the function of the muscle uh, kind of uh, on trial. But with that, you're also taking to end range uh, a, a ligament or a tendon or a mm -hmm. joint capsule or some sort of like... Um, some sort of articulating soft tissue or something like that. That's why I think stretching your low back is so bad mm. or like the inversion stuff or people like hanging upside down with bands and like distracting. Well, you know why they back. like that because it's temporary relief, you know? Sure. Yeah. But it's, it's a, it's a positive feedback loop, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Where the, the more you do it, the more you're going to have to do it because right. you're not, you're not addressing the reason why those muscles are tight. That's right. You're right. bringing to end range these. So the problem I have with some of that end range contract 90, 90 stuff like we were discussing off air yeah. is that especially with hips is like the issues are usually when the person is loaded on their feet 
And if the intervention is not testing as close to that objective outcome as we can, i.e. you're laying on the ground with your knees on the floor mm-hmm. rather than standing on the ground with your feet on the floor, the, the, the responsiveness and the neurological adaptation that comes with loading one foot on the ground sure. as far as evoking instability is going to be so much greater than so the let's range. let's talk about that for a second because I'm somebody who I know struggled with internal rotation of my hips in the 90 90 yeah. I, I mentioned to you with activating it lifting my my feet up off the ground was a I told you game changer you laughed at me and so <laughs> yeah but so you but, didn't you didn't stop lifting either. No, of you know course I mean? you did that. And yeah, but I would like stuff. to hear what Jordan like because I know Jordan's probably not getting down in a ninety nine do it. But if I ha- if you were to you know give me movements or exercises that you think would benefit me if I lack internal rotation of my hips, what would that look like? Because he's, he's saying standing. What would I be doing standing? Oh, like? so I mean, if we think, and this is the thing, it's not it's not obvious to most people why we need internal rotation of the hip for bilateral loaded movements like the squat. Mm-hmm. Why do we need internal rotation of the squat? It's Think of it more like an arc of rotation. There's a bit of a debate over it, isn't there? Hmm. It kind of, but it's just a misunderstanding of okay, when we need internal ro- tracking. Think, so think of a baseball player, right? Like a baseball player, a pitcher, for example. When So pitchers are often diagnosed with GERD, right? Not a gut issue, but a general internal or glenohumeral internal rotation deficiency. Okay. They're not deficient in internal rotation. Their arc of external rotation, their arc of rotation is retroverted. Right. So if is my bicep stronger in the shortest position or the length of position or right in the middle? Probably in the in the in the in the, in the middle or short. Sure. Contract and shorten. Exactly. Well it, right in the middle right from the a middle. length tension relationship. So imagine I'm trying to generate force through my shoulder when I'm pitching, mm. but that end range of motion from the prime mover standpoint is to a point where it's stretching everything mm-hmm. because I'm so biased in external rotation because that's where I'm starting with my pitch. If you take the majority of power lifters and get them to lay face up, their toes are pointed to either side of the room. Because they're biasing that external rotation. Yeah. So when they're in that bottom mm-hmm. position, so it's not so much improving. It, so it is, in a sense, improving internal rotation, but it's anteroverting the arc of rotation so that in the bottom of the squat, all our main movers that are going to move us vertically are in a position to express strength through a ideal length tension relationship. So mm-hmm. I think the main mechanism of correction with the 90-90, it's almost like when my mom used to trick me into eating vegetables by mixing it up in my spaghetti sauce. Mm. So it's sorry. Is that is that culture? No, 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 you're good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. When she used to make me eat my pineapple by putting it in my pizza. God damn it! <laughs> um, it's it's the ability. So you don't need internal rotation in your hips until you're an extension of your hips. So a lot of people, what they perceive as an internal rotation issue, is actually a bias towards hip flexion, right? So if we think of when we're walking. When do we need internal rotation? It's when this hip's in end range extension. So work on extension first, and a lot of times that clears mm-hmm. up. But so the 90-90 position does have that hip in relative extension. The activation, it's not so much that it's building stability. It's more anteroverting that arc of rotation, mm-hmm. which is in itself not a bad thing. But I think the intermediate, so your, your question was, what exercises could I do? Yeah, I think I'm glad something, you're getting there. I think something like, like hip airplanes or loading, using Oh, weight. like Miguel planes, those? McGill, like stand on one leg. McGill airplanes or whatever. Or the one where you, you on the single leg and then you yeah rotate. yeah. So you're basically like if you can't stabilize your own body weight with one of your hips, you shouldn't try to load more than your own body weight from both of your hips because you're reliant now on structural stability rather right. than function. Right. So mm-hmm. and that structural stability, or even like maybe Bulgarian split squats. Yeah, just a, yeah, that's a great example. Load. Yeah, unilateral load, but then it comes down to which hand you load it in because most people intuitively load it in mm. the the gait cycle pattern, yeah, which right. is going to be more the anterior oblique sling. And, but you want to do it in the actually the non-intuitive pattern, which is dumbbell in the hand of the side of the foot that's down. Right, right. So, you, so if you're doing so a, is, a right leg so exercise, you want to hold the dumbbell with the right hand. Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. Excellent. Next question is from Freaky Jake. This must be one of your friends, Jordan. <laughs> I, don't Are, know. I see he's Bosu into ball. Some shit. He's not my friend. Are <laughs> the Bosu ball and other stability things a good tool for building knee stability? Now, before we rip into it, because <laughs> I know we're going to, um, before we rip into it, here's what I like about stability balls in particular for beginner clients. So as personal trainers, and this is, by the way, uh, your entire routine should not revolve around a stability ball, but I would use them sometimes with beginners mainly because it's a easy reminder for that person Mine did, like to, 2002. To, stay, to stay stable and tight when doing an exercise. That's all it is. People, when they tend to sit down on anything or stand, they've developed this pattern where it's almost like they're their joints are supporting them and they're kind of just standing there and things are, they're not really being a- able to, to activate their bodies. When you put someone on a stability ball, especially a beginner, somebody that's super deconditioned, you don't want them to fall off. It almost, it's like a reminder like, okay, I got to kind of stay steady and tight so I can do this exercise. That's where I see some of the benefit. 
Now we can rip into it. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> there's a few that. things here just by the way the question's framed because it's talking about knee stability. Yeah. Knee stability doesn't exist. It's structural entirely. That's right. right. So yeah, it flexes and extends. It flexes and, extends. It. and then yeah. people are going to make the argument. Well, what about the VMO? It's like okay, so we got to we got to draw a hard line between knee stability and femur stability, which will bring us will circle us back to the gait cycle point that I feel like I've mm. just been reiterating all morning. Mm. Mm. Um, so Bosu ball first. I think it's it's this is emblematic of the conversation we had earlier about the pendulum in the fitness industry, where the the middle line is education it's understanding that if we can we can implement a stimulus of instability by implementing unilateral load so all the all the stability you need to evoke for your body to be able to get strong you can generate by altering your base support stand on one leg and do shit right, mm-hmm. right? so i think on one end of this pendulum swing we have this resistance this resistance market where it's like, well, we can't stand, we can't sell people standing on one leg. So here, put a band around your knees and we're going to, that's how you're going to stabilize your knees. It's like, all right, we're missing the boat. Plus there's nothing to sell if you tell someone to stand on one leg. Exactly. So on the other side of the industry, we have this extra physiological stimulus of instability that becomes nothing more than a parlor trick and skill adaptation, right? The transferability of someone who can stand on a BOSU ball or stand on a med ball is not correlative to someone who can stand on one leg. It doesn't translate. It doesn't translate. But what does translate is the ability to stand on one leg and then for the ability to deviate your own center of gravity within that limited base of support. Like do a single leg RDL mm. right, right. would be because knee stability is ACL, MCL, PCL, yeah. LCL. And those things don't move. Those things don't move. No. You can't train them. They're inert. No. It's just structure. No. And, and, and look, I'll tell you what, uh, stability balls Most and bosu balls, bouncy balls, stability balls and bosu balls would definitely have a lot of carryover if the earth was made of stability balls. That's and what I'm balls. saying. <laughs> now that we also got to draw a line and distinction between uh, primary and secondary prevention. You take an aspirin, a baby aspirin every day and you haven't had a heart attack. Yeah, you're still equal likely from a primary prevention standpoint to have that heart attack. Afterwards, there is research to show that that baby aspirin could potentially help secondary prevention. So right. I think maybe some of the benefit, and I don't know if knee, and I remember seeing a, a collegiate female soccer study that had the BOSU ball as an intervention. Yeah. I don't know if it had a positive or a negative effect on, because I, I think if- Well, it had a positive, I, I did. Re, I think I read that same study. And by the way, the reason why they, they used female athletes is because- the rate of ACL tears in female athletes is like twice as high or something it's ridiculous. purely morphology. Yeah. The Q angle from the hip is going to set an inward That's trajectory right. of that femur. So yeah. basically... And what you, women are, have wider hips, yeah. uh, you know, because they're hot. Um, and that angle from <laughs> hip to knee has something um, to do with birth yeah. and the ratio. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's probably yeah, well, my bad. Thanks. <laughs> my bad. We're, Adam's fact checking yeah. for us. Right <laughs> now. Yeah. No, but no, no, but but because their hip, their, their hips are wider, and they the, that angle from hip to knee is, is a sharper angle. It places more stress on those ligaments. You want to strengthen your knee, or you want to have better knee stability. Get your hips and ankles more stable because those are mobile as fuck joints yeah the knee doesn't need stability it's its own stability is it's it's uh what's the word self-evident it's got those yeah that's it it's got those ligaments but like like i said with the stability ball you put a client a new client on a stability ball i like doing that sometimes because it just reminds them to fucking stay tall and stay tight you put them on a chair or a bench and it's like i got to keep like fix your posture sit up tight tighten your core you put them on a physio ball and they're like oh shit i'm gonna fall so i better tighten things up and that's where i see the benefit in it but i don't see any you know benefit aside from that but boy there was a period there in personal training i'll tell you you could just push them a little and then they'll brace yeah i'll I'll tell you in in personal training there was a period there where that's all i remember when it happened too it was like we went from people using machines all the time to trainers were using bands and balls and one that legged shit on Dyna discs yeah. for every single leg. I think I, I really think that the and you you said it real quick, but I think circling back to that, the single best movement that I've ever taught to do that would be a single leg deadlift. You yeah. s- and I think because you're you're getting both, it, do it barefoot too. You know, do a do a barefoot single leg deadlift. I feel like you're going to get a lot of mobility, strength all the way from the foot all the way up to the hip, which then in turn is going to help protect or keep this knee with it stable like they want. For right? sure, but it definitely went too far with the with the stability stuff it just got so fucking ridiculous with yeah. people doing every single exercise on those things so uh you know no as far as knee stability is concerned basically what we're saying traditional exercises uh, uh, for the hips the ankles and unilateral movements mm-hmm. probably the best next question is from klepzolius rex what's the most ridiculous pieces of fitness equipment you have seen uh, <laughs> yeah uh, God. Man, I mean it's, it's low hanging fruit man <laughs> I love it though uh, I mean what do we got up here 
jaws. Well, here, how about this? All right. How about this? What are the most ridiculous pieces of fit- fitness equipment you see that are actually machines and stuff? Yeah, in the gym? how about in gyms? These are e- two, these are too yeah, easy, right? Are, the blades, the shake weight, jaws. As seen like, on TV. Kind I'd, of rather stuff pile, I'd rather pick um, apart some Let's talk about gy- machines. Core, core machines, loaded oh, spinal yeah. flexion. Oh, that's, yeah. Oh, then just, yeah, like, um, you know, Hammer Strength makes like the loaded rotational oblique thing, and it's like, Okay, you clearly know one in at hammer. So what's wrong with that? Let's talk about that first. Well, sure. All right. So the obliques are so there's every muscle has a primary action, Mm -hmm. right? Which most people can surmise based off like, okay, I'm gonna contract my bicep. All right, elbow flexion. But it's like it's it's performance exists in it's like a good lie. Devil's in the details, right? So I think it exists in the peripheral, secondary, and tertiary action. So with you know, we're gonna take for example, you're on your knees and then you're like rotating against the resistance of these pads on your shoulders. You guys know what I'm talking about? Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So but the obliques made my core look awesome. <laughs> yeah. But the obliques are well first off, core doesn't need to be strong. Right. And I fucking feel like a broken record because there's a difference between strength and stability. If there is one takeaway from this episode, that's what I want it to be. So the core is it. So I look at the body as three hubs of stability and basically any pathology from a functional standpoint can be even structural. If the goal is to out function Mm -hmm. that bad structure is shoulder, hip and spine. Those are hubs of stability. Those are going to govern range of motion and strength output, period, right? So the way I look at it from a core standpoint, well, that's a, that's the epicenter of our spinal stability. So that needs to be able to resist force really well. So mm-hmm. not rotation, but counter-rotation. Counter-rotation. Pre- I think, okay, prevent- so there is a benefit in having adequate range of motion in trunk rotation. That's huge because that'll course. that'll affect how our hips have to compensate in Especially kind. for sports. Mm-hmm. Huge, right? I think that's a big underpinning in, in sports hernias is a, discrepancy in trunk stability to hips or uh, trunk mobility and hip mobility um but i think based off of the external oblique or the oblique machine it's the external oblique is a lateral flexor to one side to the same side Mm -hmm. and it's a rotator to the opposite side but also posteriorly tilts the pelvis right so these machines are just very uniaxial in a sense that it's moving around that y-axis which is if the only muscle that really does that is the transverse abdominis Mm pure rotation based off fiber orientation but again it's not about shortening the muscle it's about isometrically resisting force rather mm-hmm. than exerting you force. want you want something to be stable and rigid when it needs to be yeah. to prevent injury right. but i will i'm going to make an argument on the other side i'm going to disagree with you on one not disagree with yeah. you actually i'm going to show another side to this and that's the the aesthetic side the muscle development side if you're trying to build a muscle yeah. so that it looks good nothing builds a muscle like full range of motion through shortening and lengthening uh, and so I can see the use in machines like this when someone's like, well, look, I like the function part, like you're saying. I want to have a stable core to prevent injury, but I also want to develop the muscles so they look really cool. Developing muscles, you develop muscles better. More hypertrophy happens when you move them through the strength, you know, the the shortening, the contracting, and the lengthening. And that's where I could see the benefit. Like if you're doing, you know, people talk about the abs, the obliques, all the muscles around the core to stabilize the spine. But what if you want to build muscles that pop out or show well, then you're going to want to throw in some of that other stuff because it's going to it's going to develop more muscle. No, uh, to an extent, man. Yeah. I think I think if we can improve function, we can improve aesthetics, right? Belt beltless work. So this is especially with the exercise. So let's talk about some of the mm. movements that we would do instead of that. Like I, the first thing that comes to mind for me is like a like a side plank, activate my glutes, and then put throw some movement in there. Yeah, I I mean landmine press oh, overhead yeah. unilateral load. Oh, yeah, so yeah. so test test or even disadvantage some of those peripheral hubs of stability so that some of that force transfer of resistance as far as ca- counter movement is now put on the spine right so loading you know you load a kettlebell overhead pressed in a in a split lunge position is going to put a lot of demand of rotation mm. depending on how you load your uh, single single arm dumbbell rows you can set a trajectory for your hips to make your spine want to rotate and then use your external obliques from stopping that from happening mm-hmm. rather than turning oh, it into a very linear. Yeah. Exactly. So I think there's Mechanism. great ways to do it. And fuck, I mean, you can be 200 pound dumbbells. We're rowing. Like yeah. I can, mm-hmm. that's a heavy loaded exercise. That hammer strength rotation machine only goes up to 150 pounds mm-hmm. and that's on a track. What a good point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I always think, I mean, I, I do agree. I do. And that's something I differentiate. What's your objective outcome? Yeah. And that's where I start. Like if I don't like running, but if you come into my office and you want to run a marathon, all right, fuck yeah, yeah. let's, let's get you there. Right. If you want to go on stage, you want to be on the Olympia. All right, we can get Because that's the thing, because a lot of people, they, they understand the functional part. They understand the importance of it. But at the end of the day, most people work out because they want to look better. Sure. And so I like to tell people you know, both sides of it. Like, okay, here's the functional piece. Here's the development piece or what's going to produce that, that look that you want. 
you got to kind of marry the two. But understand this, that you're right with the core, it's about stabilization. And that's very important. I mean, if you want to prevent injury, look, that's the most common area. People tend to fuck themselves up and nothing will make you look shitty, like not be able to work out because you hurt yourself. Exactly. And that's you know? a long-term bottleneck is going to be that injury. Right? It is. But I also will say this, and this kind of goes in, in uh, a little bit on your side. The most developed obliques and core muscles I've ever seen were on lean power lifters who never did a single crunch or yeah, sit up yeah. or rotation exercise just from stabilizing themselves, being able to lift. Sumo deadlift. Yeah. Sumo deadlift. You want obliques? Sumo deadlift. Yeah. yeah Cause yeah. It, so when you conventionally deadlift and this is something that I have to talk to a lot to my lifters about is when you conventionally deadlift, you're using your lats. Your lats are crazy stabilizers of rotation of the trunk. So strong. Right. And again, we're going down the rabbit hole of tertiary and quaternary action of the muscle. But when we're at a disadvantage, already shortened position because we're taking a grip inside the knees. Now, if the lats are disadvantaged in managing rotational forces, then we're actually invoking more rotational force. Because if you have one arm that's longer than the other, or you have a, a leg drive in your sumo mm -hmm. stance that's stronger on one side, the, the fact that you're grabbing closer in on the bar, there's more force outside your hands you than a longer lever on the outside. Exactly. So that'll start. You know, you see a lot of people start to helicopter with the sumo deadlift. Mm. That's trunk rotation. Well, what do you, I mean, you'll see a higher rate of oblique tears or high groin sprains in the uh, sumo deadlift. Oh, I didn't even think of that. In, yeah, that's brilliant. So, now you say, I'm totally picturing that right now going like, oh, shit, what a great way to develop right. so, the obliques. Yeah, so reinforcing the anterior oblique sling, which is the external oblique into the opposite mm -hmm. side high adductors. Mm -hmm. and, but if you don't have the function of that and you try to load a heavy sumo, and that's what I'll see guys go from the sumo puts you at an advantageous position from you know if forces work biomechanics time. yeah if, if work is four times distance and we're cutting the amount of distance then we can effectively mm -hmm. exert more or do more work with exerting the same amount of force mm -hmm. so in that stance everyone is you know from biomechanics like you said uh, in a position where they could technically load more weight but they get hurt because their lats are out of the equation and in the conventional deadlift the lats are going to remain yeah. supreme we take those out now maybe we've worked with the belt a lot which we know to actually diminish the output of the external oblique so here we have this muscle that's standalone now on trial trying to hold up to your yep, your max right. or if not more than your max because of the biomechanical now damage. i have a question for you uh because we just got on deadlifts here for a second knowing the differences between the sumo deadlift and the conventional deadlift do you see carryover for let's say somebody I, I like to pull conventional that's where i can pull the most weight um do you see carryover for me spending cycles getting better at sumo deadlifts would there be some carryover there to help me with my main lift would be my, which would be con conventional so i look at it as a way to if if you're stronger in your conventional pull i would say no i mean i know that i'm averse to training it it's just uh, the majority of the times it's okay do you want a hip injury or a back injury Okay, you want a hip injury? Sumo deadlift. You want a back injury? Conventional mm. deadlift. Eventually, like that's where the that's where the reaper of injury is going to rear its head for each of those okay. lifts, respectively. So, I think if you pull sumo, you should absolutely pull conventional. I don't think for how irregular that loading pattern is based off how we're meant. Right, to like function. how many other times are you ever going to be in a position exactly. like that? Yeah, pulling I, 400, I, 500 what pounds. What would give you more carryover, uh, a, 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 like to a conventional deadlift, a sumo lift, or practicing that, or something like a trap bar deadlift? Mm, okay, neither. so I think a trap bar deadlift would carry over better to sumo because sumo is a lot more quad dominant mm -hmm. than people think. Because if you watch, how you, it's not as fluid. If you watch a proficient sumo deadlifters, their knees are extended before their back's extended, which is rarely the case in, in a good deadlift. Your knees and hips should come to that at triple time. exactly at the same time. Where watch Yuri Belkin pull 927 off the floor beltless at 227. Mm -hmm. He snaps his quad so fast, but it's the it's the inertia of getting that bar moving that carries him through that end range hip All extension, right. right? So sumo deadlifting is if it's in your sport or if you're you know, if you're, if you're a taller athlete in like a, like, you know, if you're a taller basketball player using that as a way to hip hinge, that's not going to, uh, increase the likelihood of injury by going through ex excessive loaded flexion mm -hmm. in that, in mm -hmm. that position. Sure. Use it sparingly. I think carryover wise, you're going to see your conventional goes up. Your sumo goes up, not necessarily your sumo goes up. Mm. Your conventional goes up. I like to do it just for, for fun because I'll notice I'll get, get it one and then I'll have to practice the other one. Yeah. And, and, and I also notice from just from a use like a wear on my body standpoint, like you said, if I push my conventional too long, my low back starts to get tired and sore. So then I'll go to sumo and, and, and then I'll start to you know, have to deal with the hip issues. Yeah. So excellent. Uh, check this out. We have a lot of free guides, free, 
free resources and guides. Uh, the Educate well-made. yourself. That's about you know flabby arm guide, flat tummy guide. We got a guide on. You ain't gonna you know, buy shit. Training, Just read it. All kinds of stuff. You go to mindpumpfree.com. You can also find us all on Instagram. Uh, Jordan, what's your Instagram handle? Uh, at the underscore muscle underscore doc. DLC. Some incredible nudes on that page. <laughs> you can also find mine, Mind Pump Sal. Slide in his DMs. Justin, oh, yeah. Mind Pump Justin. Adam, Mind Pump Adam. And also, if you think putting pineapple on pizza is fucking stupid, make sure you let Jordan Shallow know on his Instagram page. <laughs> Bring it on. Yep. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now, plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.